Hey everyone, it's pretty much the end of the month and I decided to do another really big compilation. I hope y'all enjoy it and hopefully it'll hold you all over until the end of the weekend. I'm officially moving into my new place this weekend, so I've got a lot going on, but everything should be back to normal come Monday. Anyways, I hope you all enjoy these stories and have a great weekend everyone. And remember... To always stay hungry. When I was a kid, I really used to love going in the pool. But when I was seven years old, that all changed. I didn't really understand it at the time, but it really makes me unsettled. So I lived in a small town. It had a small park and pool. The park was right next to the pool. Then there was a long strip of baseball fields. So my mom took me to the pool, and we had just paid for the day and went in. The pool layout is kind of like this. It was a long pool with the deep section as soon as you walked in. No diving boards. Then there was a five foot section. I really don't know how else to describe it. It had ropes and lining on each section for people to swim back and forth. Then it curved into the shallow area, with some tall slides and the most shallow area. It had a palm tree that dumps water and a small kid slide as well. That served as the baby pool, I guess, because all the little kids were always there. So I was in that section right under the palm tree. My mom was over on a chair reading a book. And before you guys say anything, I knew how to swim a little bit. So anyways, I was playing in the pool when this middle-aged woman came up to me with two kids. One was about my age and the other was about 12. The woman had dark shades over her eyes and dark black hair and very pale skin. I didn't really think much of it because it was crowded and parents were with their kids all the time down there. The woman then said to me, Hi, can you play with my kids? I didn't look her in the eyes, but I said hi back, and I then nodded. Kind of a strange question, but I was an only child, and not many kids lived on my street. So we went to the big slides, and the kid around my age said she couldn't swim, so me and the 12 year old went up. As we're waiting in line for the slide, he had asked my name, and I asked his. Let's call him Billy. Billy then says after, if my brother were here, he would love this. I then stared at him and asked, Where is he now? He turned his head away from me and then said, Oh, just forget I mentioned it. Then after that, we went down the slide a couple of times. He then pulled behind the slides. If that lady, I, I mean my mom, asked you to come with, don't. Now, I knew about stranger danger, but what a strange thing for a kid to say. Why? I asked. He was nervous, and he was bouncing in place and tapping his foot. It's for your own good, he says. Then he walks away. I found that really strange, but I went back to the shallow area. Not even two minutes later, the same lady walks up to me. Hey, would you like to come with us and get some lunch and ice cream? She asked sweetly. She was so nice, and she looked like any other mom. She didn't give any weird vibes. I opened my mouth to reply, but I looked over to the fields of chairs, and then saw Billy standing next to the same girl, and a different girl that looked around three years old. Uh, no thanks, I said to the woman. I looked around to see where my mom was, but I didn't see her anywhere. I began to panic. The lady then bent down to my level and said, We can get you a toy. How about a doll? You like that shit, right? Um, no, I said, then started to walk through the water to get away. She then grabbed my hand and started to pull me. Then I started screaming. Nobody cared though because it just looked like a mom dealing with her bratty child. I then bit her and she let me go. I then ran into the ladies restroom and I hid in the showers. I went into the stalls. 
After a couple of minutes passed and what felt like hours, I finally stepped out. There she was looking inside her locker. What do you want? She said to me. I cried. You're my kid now. She said. I tried to run and I had started screaming for my mom. The lady ran after me, then sang. Stop, you little shithead! I finally got out of the bathroom, and my mom was waving at me from the fence. She had pizza. I ran out of the gate and ride to her. The lady wasn't following anymore. I then told my mom everything that happened, and she called the police. But unfortunately, the woman was long gone at this point when they arrived. My childhood is a real blur to me, but that still lives fresh in my mind. This next part happened when I was 25. I'm 30 now. I was shopping in Walmart one day, and I looked at the missing kids board, and I actually saw Billy's face. I knew for sure that it was him. He had the same name and face. Billy went missing when he was nine, and next to him was a three-year-old looking girl. Thanks for listening to my story. I know that it's long, but to everyone who thinks kidnappers are just old men, you're wrong. I want to thank Billy for saving my life that day. I really wish I would have saved yours in return. And that psycho woman at the pool who tried to kidnap me. Fuck you, and I hope you rot in hell. I'm in the UK and the following encounter took place in the late 80s when I was 11. For a bit of background info, I was painfully shy as a child and was also very innocent. I wasn't very streetwise, and I also looked very young for my age. So when I was 11, I could have easily passed for 8 or 9. I led a very sheltered childhood and was probably what you could call the typical only child. My mother was very strict, but she also had a tendency to panic over the slightest things. Worry was her middle name. On the plus side, I also had stranger danger drummed into me by my parents, and our school would also regularly invite people to come in and warn us as to the dangers of speaking to strangers and going off with them. Thinking about it now, it's only when I became an adult that I realized that we were always warned about strange men whom I want to lure us away. And all her warnings, my mother had always advised me to approach a friendly looking lady if I was ever lost or needed help. I know that we live in a different time now, but it seems to me that we were never warned that women could be just as sinister and dangerous as men. Thus, I give you my scariest childhood encounter with an adult. At the time of this incident, I was in my last year of primary school, and we were about to finish for the summer. It was a bright, warm July day, and our teachers decided to take my class to the local park for the afternoon. It was for a treat, and to celebrate the end of term. We played some games and we had some really nice refreshments, and at this point, my best friend Nikki and I decided to leave the group to go play on the swings. I was really surprised that our teachers allowed us to do this, but given that there were 30 girls in our class, they probably didn't notice that we wandered off. The park itself was very large, and there was a small playground area with some swings on the other side of the park. We headed over to the swings, and we were chatting and giggling while we idly sat on the swings, as 11-year-old girls tend to do. I had been best friends with Nikki from day one, and we had practically been inseparable for four years. We were about to make the transition from primary school to secondary school. It was really bittersweet because I was quite glad to be leaving that primary school, but while Nikki was staying on to attend the secondary school, I was moving to a different school in another area. This is probably why we wanted to make the most of the remainder of our time at the school together, and why we just wanted to be away from the rest of the class. You know, to enjoy each other's company, as we always did. We were so busy chatting and laughing that we had failed to notice two women approach the swings. They must have been several feet away when I spotted them, and they were clearly making a beeline for us. We had no idea where they'd come from, because as far as we were aware, our class and teachers were the only people in that part of the park. 
Obviously, we hadn't been very vigilant or aware of our surroundings. The woman came right up to us and stood at what must have only been only a couple of feet away from us. I remember thinking that they looked too old to want to play on the swings. I noticed that they were both grinning, although not in a warm, friendly way, but more of a mischievous way. They started asking us how old we were and what we were doing there. I was always a very polite child, so I answered politely that we were 11 years old and that we were there with our class. I remember one of them smirking as she looked around the park. They seemed to hone in on me for some reason, and were far more interested in talking to me than they were to my friend. The very same woman then told me that they were both 18. I remember thinking that they looked a lot older than that, and they could have been in their late 20s or older. When you're a child, you tend to think that anyone who isn't a child seems a lot older, but even thinking about it now, I'm convinced that they were considerably older than 18. It seemed to be the same woman who was asking all the questions, while the other one simply just stared at us with this malevolent smirk. She then told me that they were both lesbians, but she used the D slur, and then she asked me if I knew what that was. I know that term would be considered very offensive these days, but this was the 80s, and the term was still used even back then. I had heard the term used once or twice, but I didn't really know what it meant. I shook my head and said no. At this point, I'm guessing that my friend knew what it meant because she suddenly looked very concerned. The women then said that it meant that they liked women. They then moved slightly closer. I know that there were only two of them, but somehow, it seemed like they were surrounding us. After all, we were only two small slender girls. The same woman then asked me if we were lesbians, but again, used the D slur to ask. This was after I had already told her how old we were. I honestly can't remember exactly what I said, but I was uncharacteristically bullshy and made a quip, most likely born out of nerves and fear. The woman suddenly looked annoyed and then snapped. Oh, so you think you're clever, do you? She then asked me if I knew what lesbians did and how they had sex. And again, using the D slur. Well, at this point, I knew that we were in serious trouble here. I spotted the look of panic and horror on my friend's face as well. She whispered to me, I don't know what to do. I was only half turned towards her because I wanted to keep an eye on what these women were doing. Without giving it a second thought, I whispered back, We need a teacher. My friend suddenly leaped up and then shouted really loudly, I'm gonna go get a teacher! Before bolting for the other side of the park, leaving me all alone with the two women. I honestly couldn't believe that she had left me alone with them. In hindsight, we should have both run back to our class, and I honestly don't know why I didn't do that. But I sat on the swing very composed, because I told myself that I didn't want to show them that I was afraid. Now that it was just me, they closed in on me, like lionesses closing in on their prey. Now it really did feel that I was surrounded. The main girl, let's say the ringleader, was now right in front of me, her legs almost touching mine. The other one was standing at the side. The thing that I remember most is the look of malevolence on both of their faces. The main one leaned over me and started rattling the chain of my swing and twisting. I thought to myself, Oh no, I'm really in trouble now. I also wouldn't say that my friend was the fastest runner in the world, but I kept expecting her to appear with an angry teacher, but nothing happened. I suddenly thought, To hell with this! and I gave the woman who was leaning over me a huge shove. I was able to get past her, and I ran like the wind, not looking back. I don't know if my life really depended on it or not, but I ran as if it had. I could hear both of the women laughing and shouting in mocking voices. Run away then. Go and get your teacher. See if we care. When I arrived back at our group, my friend had told me that she had told the teacher, but she just dismissed her and hadn't taken her seriously. Now, I had never thought that highly of those particular teachers, 
but I couldn't believe that she hadn't even bothered to come over and check, especially as she knew that I was over there alone. Thankfully, my friend and I were soon able to shake off our scary experience, but it's still something that I think about from time to time. To this day, I really don't know what those two women were planning for me and what their intentions were. I don't know what possesses two grown women to decide to scare and intimidate two young girls. Was it just for perverse kicks? I don't know. I'm just so glad that I decided to leg it back to my class instead of waiting for my friend to return with the teacher, especially as the teacher had no intention of coming over. I really don't know what would have happened if I hadn't, and thinking about that, well, it really gives me the chills. Please stay safe, everyone, and especially if you're a child. This happened during my childhood. I would say I was probably around six or seven years old at the time, but definitely really young. I lived in Bullhead City, Arizona at the time, and my brothers and I went to have a getaway with one of our childhood parental figures. Her name is Caroline. We did many things, such as going to the arcade, having lunch at Sonic, and went around the town. This all happened in Laughlin, Nevada at one of the many casinos. I'm pretty sure it was the Colorado Bell, but I could be wrong. Anyways, there was a kid-friendly area where there was arcades and stuff that we could do. I remember very well the game that I was playing was skee-ball. For those who don't know what skee-ball is, it's a game where you take like five or six balls, and you roll it up a rim to try and dump it in a projected score, and then you gain tickets to get a prize after you're done with the arcade. During the game, I had taken it upon myself to cheat and climb up the ramp and then manually dump the balls in the higher points. Yeah, I know. Real mature. Well, when doing so, an older woman probably in her 30s or early 40s watched me do this, and I smiled at her, yet I felt embarrassed. From what I could remember, because it was so long ago, she had a creepy smile on her face, and she told me that she didn't have a problem with what I was doing and I remember her asking if I wanted to go with her somewhere. Being young and extremely naive about the situation, I would have said yes, but I guess the angels above were watching over me, or maybe Caroline just knew what was going on. All I can remember next, though, was that there was a few police officers in the casino that surrounded her, and had then assessed the situation, and to the best of my knowledge, the woman was apparently a well-known drug addict. In Laughlin, Nevada in the early 2000s, this was not an uncommon thing. The homeless and junkies swarmed the area. And not to mention, drug addicts and gambling go hand in hand, considering there was a casino not far from where we were. Well anyways, they ended up escorting her out, and we went about our day. And that's pretty much the end of it. Okay, so fast forward years later, I'm now 27 years old and I live in Washington. And I always knew this happened, and I would always keep replaying it in my head. So I finally called both my mom and dad and asked if they remembered anything about me being almost kidnapped. Both of them told me they couldn't remember anything, and they told me it must have been a bad dream of some sort. But I know for sure that it wasn't a dream, because I remember so much from this day, and a child's memory does not lie. I remember it happening. Maybe they just forgot it happened over time. Or maybe Caroline just didn't tell my parents that this happened, I guess to avoid not being able to see us again. I also know that time can be a factor and can make people forget, but I was a child and I remember everything from my childhood and I know that this happened. So to conclude this, to the creeper junkie who wanted to take me away, I'm strong and I won. I really hope you never did that to any other kid and I hope you got the help you needed. I'm a 28 year old female. To give you a little background, I work for a resale store that has recently moved me to a different location for me to run as the store manager. Now I had closed on this day, and after I did the bank deposit for the night, I decided to detour out of my way for some McDonald's for dinner. After waiting in line and receiving my food, 
I had headed to the nearest freeway to head home for the night. I work about 50 minutes away from where I live, so I have quite a bit of a drive ahead of me. I start on my way as I listen to some Southern Cannibal on my drive home. I looked at a road sign, and I then realized that I've been heading the wrong direction of home. So I get off the highway, and I pull up my GPS, and I realize that I had put the right address in, but for the wrong town. So I retie my address into the GPS, checking to make sure I put in the right address this time. I then hop back on the freeway and head toward home. As I'm merging onto the freeway, and as I get over, I realize there's a car coming up quickly on me, and I stay on my speed and just hope they're going to go around me. I get this eerie feeling in the pit of my stomach, however, and I keep my eyes forward on the road. Now, this car was very close to the back end of my car. I then called my husband, as I was starting to become scared. He told me that he was sure it was fine, and maybe the person just didn't know what they were doing. While on the phone with my husband, this car got over into the other lane, and I had felt a little better now. I then told my husband that he was going around, and I then realized my husband was right. Once I was off the phone, he got over, and then close behind me yet again. I felt like when he got back over, he could have hit my car with just how close he was. He then did this one more time, getting over, only to get back over and get close behind me once again. Then he followed me for a while, while I kept telling myself that he was just going in the same direction as I was. I quietly prayed to God, asking him for my safety. Then, I was coming up close on the car right in front of me. So I went around the car, and as I predicted, the car follows right behind me. I began to think to myself, why would he ride my bumper but then go around the slow car? This happened a couple of times before I saw my chance when there was quite a bit of cars in front of me. I sped up, and I then lost myself within those cars, and I finally lost the creepy truck that was following me. I kept looking in my mirror just to ensure the truck wasn't behind me. I didn't call the cops because I didn't have a license plate to give them, but now I'm really worried they might have followed someone else home. The whole rest of the way home I was in so much fear, but I did finally make it home safely. To the person that followed me and made me a nervous wreck that night, I want you to know that you're a psychotic creep, and I hope I don't encounter you again. Please everyone, always watch out for your surroundings, and if you feel uneasy, it's probably for a good reason. This happened just a few days ago. My brother is 20, and I'm 18. This is one of the most terrifying experiences in my life. It was a Tuesday night, and my brother and I had just arrived at the airport after a long plane ride. It was around 9pm at the time we landed. My brother and I had been with our aunt who went with us to visit family on the other side of the country. We had grabbed our luggage and headed out. My uncle picked us up and took us back to his house so we could go back to get my brother's car and then we can drive the rest of the way home. For some reason, my uncle didn't want the two of us to stay the night at his house, which was disappointing due to the fact that it was almost 10 p.m. when we made it. We decided to get on the road as soon as possible if we wanted to make it home before midnight. We had stopped to get some fast food and my brother coffee. I didn't get any coffee because I wanted to be able to sleep on the ride back. A blessing to those who aren't driving. I don't usually sleep in the car. It's quite rare for me to do so. But we had been traveling since 8 in the morning. After we ate, I closed my eyes, quickly drifting off. I wasn't sure how long it had been. We were still on the 241 toll road for all I knew. I happened to wake up though, in the most unpleasant way possible. My eyes snapped open, my whole body slamming around the car like crazy. I hit my head on the car door. I was in utter shock, so when I looked up and out the window in front of me, I saw that my brother's car was spinning out of control. We both had no clue what the hell was going on. I then saw the pure fear in my brother's eyes, 
which scared me even more than I had already been to wake up to this. We slammed in and out of the cones separating the two different sides of the road. I was way too scared to move or speak. I felt tears in my eyes start to well up, and I gripped onto the door rest as hard as possible. Suddenly the car completely shut down. My brother tried to put it in drive and get us moving again, but to no avail. I looked around, and not a single car in sight. That ruled out a car crash of the cause of this. I then turned to my brother, my body shaking more violently than ever. I was being overstimulated with adrenaline. What the hell just happened? I managed to mumble out, my voice breaking throughout the simple question. I don't know. I think something broke. Maybe one of the tires blew out. That was our first theory. He thought that it was that because apparently one of the lights on his dashboard had turned on and it was the tire pressure sensor. It said that it wasn't working and needed to be checked. He kept trying to get the car to start again and move again, but it just wouldn't. Half of his car was now blocking the fast lane, facing traffic, while the other half was on the other side of the road in the right lane. So yeah, we were blocking two lanes, and we had no clue what to do to get out of this mess. Dude, turn on your hazards! I told him in a panic when traffic started coming our way. My brother did so, as well as his high beams. He started to honk at people passing by to see if anyone would stop to help us. What do we do? Shouldn't I call 911? I asked. I don't know, dude. We might not even make it out of this. I'm going to try and move the car again. If no one helps in 10 minutes, I'll let you call. He said. We really didn't want to get the police involved because they might call our mom, who was sleeping, and my brother's insurance might raise. The fact that my brother mentioned the possibility of a death sent me over the edge. I felt a small tear roll down my cheek, but I didn't want my brother to see me crying, so I quickly wiped it away. After a few more minutes, I pulled out my phone, then telling my brother I was going to make the call. Typing those numbers in my phone gave me so much anxiety. I never thought that I'd ever have to call 911 in my life, but there I was, typing in each digit as fast as possible. I was surprised that they didn't answer right away. They only picked up after a few rings. A lady on the other end picked up, asking the casual question. Hello, um, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but we got into a car accident. I told the lady on the other end of the line. Okay, where are you? What's your name? Who's with you? She asked. I was too scared to explain anymore, so I handed the phone to my brother after asking him to speak for me. Hey, I'm with my younger brother. I believe that we're on the 261 toll road heading southeast. We're stuck in the middle of the road and my car won't move. Okay, so 261? Are you sure? Because it says your location is the 241. The lady asked. Well, my location on the map says the 261. Though yours is probably more accurate. My brother told her. The operator then went on to ask the other important questions, like our phone number and what exactly happened and if either of us were hurt. Well, we're both fine, and we asked for them not to send any ambulances. She agreed, and they told us they'd have Highway Patrol help us shortly. After a while of trying, my brother finally got his car to move, and we then got out of the middle of the road and pulled over to the street. My brother got out and ordered me to do the same, because it was the safest thing to do. I went over to his seat and then got out through the driver's side. I jumped over the railing where I would be the safest while my brother went to check out his car. We then heard a horrible metallic scraping noise when we drove out to pull over and he thought that it really was a tire that he blew. It was freezing out and I was still full of so much adrenaline so I was practically vibrating. Soon enough, Highway Patrol finally came, and they helped my brother check out the car. I then got back in now that it was safe. There was a massive dent in the hood of my brother's car, and there were new scrapes all over. They both looked under the car, and they saw that the plastic around the oil pipe had broke, which is what was making the scraping noise. 
There was actually nothing wrong with any of the tires. So the highway patrol officer told us that he saw a cone in the middle of the road, and that maybe my brother might have ran over that and lost control. He agreed with that. The highway patrol officer then helped my brother cut off the plastic, and we were good to go. We made it home safely by 1 a.m., and I'm never sleeping in a car again for a very long time. This is a story that happened in June 2009, and I've actually got a news article linked of the tragedy. You can include it in the description. At the time, I was dating a girl that lived two hours away from where I lived. I actually have another story about the same girl as she was off her rocker, but that's a story for another day. Anyway, I digress. I went to spend the weekend with my girlfriend, and we had spent the whole weekend doing hikes and road trips. On a Sunday night, I had left her house pretty late and headed back home as I had to work the next morning. In hindsight, that was probably stupid on my part because I was really exhausted and probably shouldn't have been driving and I should have left much earlier. As I approached my place, however, I thought that I had seen something on the side of the road and I assumed it was a very large dog that got hit by a car, as there was also a car on the side of the road with its four-way flashers on. It wasn't even a kilometer away from where I thought I'd seen the dog, and the highway was a T-intersection. It was where you had to stop and turn left or right, and right across from that intersection was an empty lot that used to have an old rundown home that was torn down maybe about a year or so before. I had to turn left 20 meters, and then turned right onto my street. That's when I then noticed a few cars on the side of the road and a bunch of people outside next to the house that is adjacent to the empty lot. That's when I realized there was a car that had smashed into the side of the house. The accident was so fresh that the police weren't even on the scene. That's also when I learned that what I drove past, it wasn't a dog at all. It was one of the bodies of the three teenagers that got ran over by a drunk driver. The driver was cut off, and he had been thrown out by a nearby bar. That's when he then got into his vehicle and drove well over a hundred kilometers. He then hit another car that made him lose control, and then sent him on the shoulder. He then ran over three teenagers who had just gotten off of a city bus. He then fled the scene, blew through an intersection, and literally drove his car into a house and somehow that stupid son of a bitch survived with minimal injuries. And the worst part? Despite destroying three innocent lives, robbing three families of their loved ones, this young man somehow only got six years of prison time. He was released in 2015, and some of the time he was incarcerated was under house arrest in his parents' home. As for myself, I was really mad at myself for driving while I was so tired. I drove right beside mangled bodies, and I didn't realize it. I might as well have been drunk driving myself. For many years, I kept wishing that I would have left my girlfriend's house just a few minutes earlier. Maybe he would have hit me instead, and those kids would have made it home alive. Those three victims would now be in their mid to late 20s by now if they were still alive. To Jasmine, Caitlin, and Steven, may you rest in peace. And to the drunk driver, Nicholas, may you rot in hell. The story happened years ago when I was a skinny 15-year-old boy. For privacy reasons, all of the names have been changed. Through our church, my parents had volunteered me to attend a long-week youth retreat out of the state. It was the middle of July when my ride showed up. I put my duffel bag in the rear trunk and then climbed inside the van to see some kids right around my age and two adult chaperones. Besides myself, there were three girls and another guy. One of the girls, named Amy, went to my school. She was a sophomore volleyball player who I would bump into from time to time, but we weren't really friends. The other two girls I knew from church, but I didn't really talk to them that much either. And the other guy, I had only seen a few times, but never spoke to him. After hours of driving, we had arrived at this really big church. This was actually where we would be staying at, at least the kids.
speaking of which, there were around 20 or so teenagers to maybe six adults. Most of the adults, including the two that brought me, didn't really stay at the church. They were housed with members of the congregation. Not much really happened that first night. We introduced ourselves and then found places to sleep. I found a really nice spot in the lower levels and I put my sleeping bag there. Then we ordered pizza and watched a movie before finally turning in. The next morning we were divided into groups and then sent to different workshops. My group accompanied a construction crew and we had actually rebuilt a home in one day. That experience felt really good. After that, we all showered at the local YMCA and then returned to the church to have dinner. The following day was another workshop, but it was much shorter, so we had more time in the evening to ourselves. The adults who were staying with us had gone somewhere, and even though they had instructed an 18-year-old to make sure we didn't leave the premises, he said we could go as long as we got back before the adults. Around half of us left to explore the town, including myself, Amy, and Dylan. It was around 7 p.m. at this point, and there really wasn't much happening. We went downtown, but many of the shops were closed, or they were starting to close up. Then we came upon a crowd of people who looked like young adults, drinking and hanging out at a park that was slightly off the beaten path. I kind of had a bad feeling, but some of the older kids wanted to check it out. So reluctantly, I went along. It was really dark, and I couldn't make out a lot of the things, but people were mostly doing all sorts of things I didn't care for. Most of the people in our group dispersed, and I found myself alone with a bunch of strangers. They all looked high or stoned, and they didn't really say anything to me. It was starting to get boring, but thankfully, our group began to reassemble to go back. I was still sitting with the strangers when Dylan then tapped me on the shoulder. I was so relieved, not knowing things were going to get much worse. As it turns out, Amy had hooked up with some guy and he wanted to show her the town, but she didn't want to go alone. So she had asked me to tag along, since I was the only person she knew. I refused at first, and all of us pleaded for her to come back, but she said if I wasn't going, she would go alone. So I relented. Thankfully, Dylan volunteered to come along as well. So Dylan and I found ourselves in the back of a pickup truck with some older guy who looked to be almost 30. We were literally in the bed with hardly anything to hold on to while speeding. I was holding on for dear life and several times I actually felt like I was going to fall out. Up front was another guy driving and then Romeo and finally Amy sitting next to the passenger window. These three yokels were howling as they then recklessly drove us further and further away from anything we knew. Soon enough, the city lights disappeared and we were now surrounded by woods and cornfields, going down dirt roads you could only imagine in horror movies. I could see the worry in Dylan's eyes, and I'm sure he saw the same in mine. I was sure at this point that these guys were going to go bury us somewhere. Suddenly, we came to a stop near the edge of a vast cornfield. Music was blasting up front, but I could see and hear that there was a commotion, and I then heard Amy cry out for help. I was about to hop down and help her when the guy in the back grabbed my arm. I tried to pull away, but he was too strong. He had a smirk on his face, and he then pointed, to which I then saw he had a gun in his pants. I was frozen with fear, and my heart totally sank. All three of us, myself, Dylan, and Amy, were going to go missing, or so I thought. Despite all of the noise in the truck violently shaking, all I could hear was my own heart beating loudly. At that moment, Amy had managed to pry open the door and then darted into the cornfield. I then heard Romeo say something like, She bit me! That's when Dylan then pushed the guy holding my arm. He was sitting on the tailgate and he had to let go of me to catch himself. We took this opportunity to hop off and run like the wind. I'm not really sure if we ran in the same direction as Amy, but Dylan was ahead of me. I can hear him brushing between the stalks of corn. Then the most terrifying thing ever happened in my life. 
I then heard the sounds of gunshots. I dropped down for a brief moment, unsure of what the hell to do. My legs went numb, and I wasn't even sure if I could move again. I didn't hear Dylan anymore, and I honestly thought that maybe he got shot. Then I heard voices, and I got up and ran as hard as I could, right in the opposite direction. I don't remember if I ever stopped moving, just that I was either walking or lightly running, trying to put as much distance as possible between myself and those other guys. In fact, I don't recall if they were even following me anymore, I just kept going and going. I eventually found myself on a road, so I walked along the shoulder until I saw a house. I was so tired and thirsty at this point that I don't even remember if it was still night or morning. I think it must have been very early in the morning. I knocked on the house's door several times, but I never heard anything. But I kept knocking and knocking until I finally heard some voices and then a man opened the door. I explained that I was lost, but for some reason, I didn't say anything about the three men. I was very young and naive at the time, and I thought if I went into all the details, it would become a national story and then my life would be turned upside down. I didn't need all that attention, so I just said I had run off and gotten lost. The police were called, and after many inquiries, I was finally reunited with my group. The most surprising thing, though, was that Dylan and Amy were already back at the church when I arrived, and get this, neither one of them had said a single thing about what really happened either. Of course, my parents were called, and they came and got me, as did Dylan's and Amy's parents. The whole situation got really ugly, with a lot of people taking the heat. However, I heard most of the blame fell on the three of us, because the other kids had said we ran off without them. Needless to say, it was the most uncomfortable car ride home ever. I never did speak to Amy or Dylan about what happened to them. We hardly ever saw each other anymore, and when we did, it was just really awkward probably because it reminded us of things we just wanted to forget. Unfortunately, everything that happened to us is unforgettable. I'll still sometimes wake up in cold sweats from time to time, as I'm sure Amy and Dylan do as well, even if we do no longer see each other. I'm 19 years old now, and this all took place when I was 11 or 12 years old. I've lived in Florida my entire life, born and raised here, and for the most part, the people are really lovely here. That is, as long as it's still daylight. The night crowd is far less hospitable, and unfortunately, that is what my story is about. It was around 7 at night when my friends asked if I wanted to go fishing. Excited, I said sure. It sounded like a great time, you know, going night fishing with my buddies. My mother let me go, and I was really excited to fish on this pond near some apartments where we lived at. This decision, however, was a huge mistake. After getting our gear into a smallish red wagon, we then set off across the street to go into our nighttime adventure. We made jokes and cracks about gators in the pond, and the fishing itself was a blast. The part where it stops being so great was on the way back home, when we took a long way home. Why would we do this, you may ask? Well, we're kids and friends, and if you know one thing about friends as kids, you always want to hang out as long as possible, and you'll use any excuse to do it. The sun had already set, and I was walking slightly ahead of my friends, who I'll call Chris and Tommy. Chris was pulling the wagon, and Tommy was close by him, and we were all just chatting it up. That is, when I turned around to add to the conversation, but soon after... I noticed a silhouette of a man about 40 feet behind us. I was a bit unsettled and surprised, as all that was down here was grass and fences, and no one ever took this way. I informed Chris and Tommy that someone was following us, but they brushed it off, not believing me at first. I imagined that they thought that I was just trying to scare them and just get them to look behind them. I kept insisting that someone was following behind us, and then they finally got the hint and looked behind us. It was at this point that I realized the silhouette of a man was now only 25 feet behind us. 
my friend's faces all grew pale and even more filled with fear as suddenly the man began running towards us. I yelled for them to run, and when looking back, I had finally saw our stalker's face. I will never forget this face so long as I live. He was in his mid-forties, average height, and he had the most terrifying, angry-looking face that I've ever seen. We slid through a fence and into an unknown neighborhood before pounding on the first door that we found. An older gentleman opened the door and had asked what was wrong. After telling him our story, he had told us to hide behind his car and he'd find this man and talk to him. Now, the man was gone for maybe about seven minutes, but it felt like hours when he finally returned. He then explained to us that the guy who saw our wagon thought that we stole something from him. The older man didn't seem to believe the guy's story, though, and neither did we. We returned home, and we never told our parents anything about it. We were just way too afraid we'd get in trouble if we did. We never went night fishing again. My name is Lee, and I'm 27 and a male. In my free time, I will often go fishing with my friends. My dad had ran a small but successful fishing business. When my father had passed, I didn't just inherit the company, but I also inherited his favorite boat, which just so happens to be an Azimuth 53. Although it wasn't actually a fishing boat, he had brought it because we spent so much time at sea. He wanted us to have a very comfortable boat. For those of you who don't know about the Azimuth 53, it's a luxurious boat often just used for yacht purposes. Now, for the story to make sense, I must explain the layout of the boat. So, you start with a hydraulic bathing platform, and on the platform to the left is a door to the crew cabin, but I mostly use it to store my fishing gear. On the right, there's steps leading up to the cockpit area. Straight on the left is a table, and an L-shaped sofa, and then opposite the sofa, there's a wet bar area, and then to the left of the bar is the side deck leading to the bow. On the bow, there's some more seating, as well as some joint sun beds. Going back to the cockpit area, to the right, there are some more steps leading to the flybridge. Opposite the flybridge controls is another wrap of seating and a table. Now remember this detail. From the seating on the flybridge, you can see the whole back of the boat. So if you're paying attention to your surroundings, no one will be able to sneak on board. To the right of the helm station is a small grill and sink. Now moving on to the inside, there happens to be a door that slides across that can be locked. As you move inside to the kitchen, to the right is an oven, and there's also a work surface that I use for bait when fishing. And then to the left of the kitchen is the fridge sink, and my food work surface, and a stove. Anyways, now on to the story. I would normally travel for an hour, heading south down in the English Channel, but I decided to adventure a bit more. So I invited my best friend Logan, and we traveled south like normal. Once we got to our normal fishing location, we decided we would travel south for another hour. As we came to a stop, we decided we would fish here. So Logan set up the fishing gear while I prepared the bait. We set up chairs and then fished for the day. Around 8 o'clock, we had packed up, and we then moved inside, with me and Logan deciding to make sushi but it went horribly wrong. We had the equipment, but it was the first time attempting to make sushi, so we ended up just hating up a couple of burgers that I had in the freezer. We then sat down and watched TV. At around 11 o'clock, Logan decided to turn in for the night, so he told me goodnight and then went to his cabin. I decided to clean the kitchen before heading to bed. Just as I was about to go to bed, I had heard a faint rumble. Now at first, I thought it was just the water splashing onto the boat. I peered out of the window, but I couldn't see more than about 10 meters. The sound suddenly stopped. I brushed it off, but it had me creeped out a bit. I fell asleep sometime around 12. At about 2.30 in the morning, I woke up to a faint knock, so I turned on my side, thinking it was nothing, and I heard yet another knock. I once again turned to face the window, and what I saw almost made me shit myself. I then saw the feet of someone walking past the windows towards the cockpit area. I got up, and I then went into the kitchen, 
grabbing my bait knife. Now, the curtains were actually closed, so the person couldn't see me unless they were on the bow looking through the driver windows. I had heard this person try to open the cabin door, but thank God I had locked it. Very suddenly, I heard a deep, croaky voice. I know you're in there, and I'm coming in one way or another. He starts to kick the sliding glass door, and I shout for Logan to wake up. Logan comes in half asleep, asking what's wrong. I then tell him someone's trying to break in. I pass him the knife and then sprint to the helm. I then turn the engines on and I start to head back towards my port. The man stopped kicking the door and then ran down to the bathing platform and we hear a splash. Logan went outside and he saw him desperately swimming for a large object that must have been his boat. Logan came back inside and we decided to head all the way back to the port. Once we got there, we went back to sleep and then in the morning, we had finally headed home. We still talk about the incident sometimes. The only scary thing is how the low rumbling I heard must have been his boat, which means he was hanging around for more than three hours. Me and Logan agreed that the only reason he jumped off the ship was because he didn't want to leave his own boat. We looked at the door, and we saw how damaged it was by the looks of it. If the man had gave it one more big kick, it would have actually shattered to pieces. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if he had actually succeeded in breaking the door. I was very young during this story, so it may be jumbled up and out of order. My family had known about a special fishing spot along a road with a forest on both sides of the road, making it just a little creepy. I was about seven at the time, and me, my father and mother, three cousins, baby sister and younger brother, all decided to go horn pal fishing. If you don't know what that is, it's during the night, and horn pal is just catfish fishing. The actual fishing spot was tucked into a hidden trail by a thick patch of trees and bushes, but it was still thin enough you could walk through and see the street lights through. We had parked on the opposite side of the entrance to the trail, with a clear view of the lake through an open patch of trees. After setting up fishing, we had a good few hours of fishing before we finally set off to go home. I don't actually remember if we caught anything, but it was still fun nonetheless. But anyways, as we're heading home, we're all walking in a single file line down the slightly long trail, the view of the road completely obstructed by the thick but thin line of trees and bushes, the streetlight shining through and helping us see along the way. My mother and my oldest cousin, who I shall keep anonymous, were at the back, and they had suddenly noticed something in the patch of trees closest to the road. The next thing I know, we were all being rushed out, as what had been noticed was some kind of dog-like creature. As soon as we had sped up, and it started darting throughout the trees, trying to circle around in front of our group and growling while it ran. My mother had just noticed its eyes and started shouting. We were all now shoving to get into the vehicle. Luckily, whatever this thing was never followed us out, and it had actually stopped just where the patch of trees had ended. But according to my mom, it had been the size of a very large dog. And sometimes, we still wonder, what would have happened if we hadn't made it out just in time? This is a pretty cool story that we occasionally bring up, but it's still creepy hearing about it, as almost every child was crying, and even my own father was freaked out. To this day, we still don't know if it was a dog, or something more, but I'm very glad we never found out. This is not my personal story, but one that my aunt told me about. It was the early 2000s, and I was a small child at the time, and my aunt had set off with my other aunt for a fishing trip in Arkansas. On their way there, they had stopped at the local store for snacks and drinks. They got their business done in the store, and were on their way once again. They arrived at the boat ramp around 2.30pm and set up their fishing gear. They fished for hours, catching a few fish, but mostly just passing the time talking. They talked and talked until nightfall started to set in. Thinking they should probably pack up and head out, they began to gather their fishing gear and then pack up. Before they reached the vehicle, a white sedan pulled in into the boat ramp parking area. 
and my oldest aunt can make out two figures in the vehicle. Instead of proceeding, they hid behind some rocks and had watched them closely, waiting for them to get out. Almost positive that the people in the car hadn't seen them, they stayed behind those rocks, then contemplating on what they should do. From the angle they were at, they could tell that the car had the driver's side door blocked. They sat there a while longer, waiting on the car to pull out of the parking lot, but it never did. So with barely any service, my oldest aunt managed to get a hold of my uncle and then tell him about the mysterious white car hindering them from getting in and leaving. With no hesitation, being the big badass that my uncle is, he was on his way. Several minutes had passed by, but eventually, my aunt could now see the headlights of my uncle then pulling into the ramp parking area. About the time he stepped out, he had a pistol on his hip, and that's when the white car roared to life and sped the hell out of there. In relief, my two aunts shaken up from the experience came out from behind the rocks. They wanted to follow the car, but with no knowledge of which direction it went, they decided not to and just reported the incident to the authorities. Nothing else ever came of this incident, and I've since grown up and moved from my home state. I live in North Carolina now, and I've had a few of my own scary encounters as well. I don't think about what happened all those years ago a lot, but sometimes I wonder what would have happened had my two aunts tried to get into their vehicle, and what sinister ideas the two in the car had planned. This is actually two stories in one. The main story happened less than 20 minutes ago at about midnight. I was out doing some late night fishing at a small but deep hole on the side of a state road near my house. Every time I fish here at night by myself, I always worry about what would have happened or what I would do if someone were to pull up next to me, but it's never happened until now. A quick detour for the second story. I wasn't always like this. I used to fish by myself in the middle of the night all the time and without a care in the world. But there was one night about 10 years ago, which perhaps merits its own post, but I'll slide it in here and include it in this story anyways. I was fishing off a seawall next to a bridge and a car pulls over next to me. It was two young men, but they were older than I was at the time and they got out. They walked up to me casually and asked if I was catching anything. I told them no, not really, and I wasn't really at all suspicious of them. I thought they were going to fish and just thought they would ask if I was having any luck or not before pulling their own gear out. The bridge was a popular fishing spot. I was sitting on the cement seawall with my feet dangling over the edge. One of the men then suddenly shoves me off the seawall right into the water. They both grab my fishing gear and then take off in their car. The fall was only about seven feet or so, if I had to guess, but it was enough that I couldn't lift myself out of the water and up the cement wall. I had to swim around it to where the water was more shallow so that I could actually climb up the wall. My mom had dropped me off that night and I was supposed to call her to come pick me up later in the night, but my cell phone had gotten wet and it wouldn't work. To make matters worse, I was also a smoker at the time and my cigarettes had also gotten wet. And as you can imagine, I really needed a cigarette. I didn't know what to do except to just sit there until eventually my mom drove up randomly. She was absolutely furious until I then explained what happened. I really shudder whenever I think about how I, or hell anyone else they did this to, could have died. These people had no idea whether or not I knew how to swim, and apparently they didn't care. If they had seen on the news the next day that I had drowned under the bridge, would they put two and two together? Would they even care? Even if you assumed that everyone's a strong swimmer, the person could have hit their head and be unconscious. There were so many rocks under that seawall. And for what? $50 of cheap fishing gear? Anyways, ever since this night, which was 10-ish years ago, I've always been more cautious when I'm alone at night. So now back to what actually happened tonight, which actually triggered me to send this. I had luckily just finished up and loaded my car back up with all of my gear. I was actually sitting in my car and making an Instagram post showing the fish I caught. A couple of yellow bullhead catfish and some bluegill. I was trying to quickly write the post and then head home 
so I was deep into the world of my phone, not really paying attention to anything else. Something causes me to then look up, and out my driver's side window, I then see that there's this pickup truck just sitting there that I didn't even hear pull up. It has one of those big steel frame structures all around the bed of the truck. I don't know what they're called, but I associate them with hunters or trappers. I have no idea whatsoever if that's an accurate association or not. I do feel like I've seen them though, or something similar, and they're usually holding kennels with dogs, so maybe that's where I got the idea. I then see that there's this stereotypical chubby redneck mullet type of guy, and he's looking in my window at me, all while smiling a creepy smile. He was the passenger. I did not and could not look past him to the driver. I have no idea how long they were sitting there. I very quickly debated winding my window down and asking what they want, but I decided to settle on just putting my car into drive, driving around their truck, and then down the street. I was so freaked out that I didn't want to immediately go home. I went somewhere else and pulled over, looking around to see if they were anywhere to be seen, and then I actually went back to the fishing spot to see if they were still sitting there or not. I didn't pull over. I just drove by. They weren't there anymore. It will always drive me crazy wondering why the hell they pulled over. Did they have something planned? Were they just curious? Did they want to help? Well, I have to worry about seeing them around town after driving off on them like that. I realize that my reaction is not completely fair. They could have been pulling over to fish as well. I mean, it is literally a fishing hole on the side of the road. It's probably about the size of a dining room or something. They could have been pulling over to see if I needed help. Who knows? All I know is, I was thinking that if I wind the window down to find out what they want, I could potentially end up with a gun right in my face for all I know. Then I could not get a chance to drive off. So I decided to drive off without acknowledging them in any way, just so I didn't miss my chance. Even now, I worry about the fact that my car has some slightly identifying marks. Nothing crazy noticeable, but just some small stickers in the window, and I really wonder if I pissed them off by driving off like that, and if they live around here. What if my wife meets up with them sometime? What if she has my daughter with her? Am I being paranoid? I just don't know. I'm still a little freaked out about it. The story happened during the winter season in 2019. My name is Rubino. I'm a 28-year-old man. In 2019, I was 24 years of age, and this was the year that I finally had more than enough money to move out of my parents' house after working hard and saving money. I was able to find a house that I could rent. It was a three-bedroom, one-bathroom house, and it was about 20 minutes away from where my parents live by car. I was happy to finally have a place of my own. When I got back home from work, it was only me, myself, and I on the weekends. I could sleep in and get out of bed at whatever time I wanted. I could relax and do whatever I wanted without being interrupted by my parents calling my name from time to time to ask me to do chores or cut the grass, or to just give me shit about something I did wrong or something I didn't do. So yeah, I really enjoyed this new freedom. But on February 13th, 2019, that's when the horror happened. That night, I was in my room chilling, and I was watching some YouTube videos on my phone, when all of a sudden, I heard a loud knock at the door. In general, I always got slightly nervous whenever a stranger would knock at the door, but it was around 11pm that night, and the fact that someone was at the door at this hour was even more nerve-wracking, but I just tried to ignore them, and I went back to watching the YouTube video. Five minutes later, the person knocked on the door yet again. I decided to look out of my room's window, and I saw a large man dressed in all black just standing there. After not opening for him, I went into full panic mode when he tried to open the door. The door was locked, but he didn't give up. He tried to break the door multiple times. Instead of calling the cops, I decided to get my pistol ready and I'm glad I did. The man broke the door's glass, unlocked the door from the inside, and then got in my place. He then ran upstairs to my room where I was, 
and I came face to face with this maniac. I saw him reach into his pocket, but I didn't waste any time. I fired multiple shots at him, and I shot him in the stomach. As you can imagine, he screamed very loudly from this, but somehow he managed to actually get up and run out of my house. Later on, the police came to my house, but by the time they showed up, the maniac was gone. The officers took my statements, but nothing really else happened aside from that. After this incident, my landlord installed another door that didn't have a big-ass window on it. It was much more solid than the old one, and he also installed security alarms and doorbell cameras as well, and he even lowered my monthly rent just to convince me to stay. The area is generally very safe, so I decided to stay and just try and get over it. I still live alone to this day, and I still enjoy it, but I'm now more paranoid at night time. Every time I go to sleep, I always lock my bedroom door just to provide myself with extra security and peace of mind. I just hope that man won't come back. This took place when I was a teenager while on summer break. My parents were going on a five-day, four-night vacation to Miami, Florida. They asked if I would be okay staying home alone, which of course I was. The first three days went fine, with nothing really eventful really happening. On the evening of the third day, I had made myself some dinner, then relaxing in the living room while watching some TV, which led to me later going to my room to play some video games. I was playing some Fortnite while talking with my friends through my headphones, when I then heard a knock at the door. I was really concerned, as it was like 11pm at this point in the night. Regardless, I was sunk into my game, so I kinda just ignored it and just continued playing my game. A short while later, I then heard a thump at my bedroom window. Now, my bedroom window was behind my desk, and I was honestly afraid to turn around. Oh shit, I don't think I locked the front door, I said to myself. I then proceeded to tell my friends that there's someone outside who could get into my house. I then threw my headphones off, and I ran downstairs as fast as I could. But as I was running downstairs, I then heard the front door creak open. I ran to my bedroom and locked the door, but not before telling my friends to call the police for me. I then turned off my computer, and I hid in my closet. My worst fears started to happen one by one. First, I heard whoever I was coming up the stairs. Then I heard my doorknob then begin to jiggle. The person then started to bang on the door very violently, and I then heard a man's voice start screaming psychotic things. I texted my parents and they said not to make a peep, that they're going to be home, and that they're going to call the cops, but I told them that I had some friends call them already. Well, right in the nick of time, the police had arrived. I guess my friends actually called them for me. They arrested the man, and apparently he had also been abusive, so he got an additional charge for actually beating his wife. We still to this day have no clue on why he targeted our house specifically. All we can come up with is this guy is just crazy, and I guess he just had some major issues. I didn't really sleep that well for a good while after this but I guess that's to be expected. The story happened about three months ago in January, and it still really creeps me out to this day. I'm 17 years old, and my mom and stepdad had left me home alone for six days, as they had planned a trip to Mexico to celebrate their wedding anniversary. I was having so much fun being home alone, I was going out and partying pretty much every day without my parents ever knowing. I should also mention that my mom had actually hid her car keys from me, but obviously I had found them. I was also driving around and seeing my girlfriend at the time as well. There was one night where I drove to her house. She lived about 20 minutes away from me, and it really wasn't a very safe area. It was also a school night, but I'd stayed at her house until about 1 a.m., well, as I was headed back home, I began to notice a car that was following me. I managed to lose them when I took a back way home, though. Once I got home, 
I took a shower, and it was almost 2 a.m. at this point, but my dogs were barking really loudly and aggressively. They usually never bark like that. Well, I start looking through the blinds to see what the hell's going on outside to cause them to bark this much. As I peek through the blinds, I saw a black car outside. What the fuck? I say to myself, that's the same exact car that was following me earlier. As you can imagine, I start to internally freak out. I then see two people walk through my backyard. I run and lock all of the doors and windows, and I close the curtains. I then heard a voice of what sounded like an older man, and he had a very deep voice. What I heard him say still gives me chills to this day. It sounded like he was on the phone with someone. This is how the conversation went. Yeah, we're here. The parents are gone. I think it's a young boy here. If I had to guess, he's around 17 to 18 years old. Yeah, don't worry. We're gonna try and take him soon. I then hear them trying to open every door and window, all the while my dogs continue to bark inside my room with me. Then, something clicked in my head. I have an older next door neighbor who's very big into guns and home protection. I knew if I was able to get his attention, he'd help me. I then zoomed to the front door, ran outside, and started screaming and banging on my neighbor's door, telling him everything that's happened thus far. Now, you would probably think by now these guys would either one, be gone by now, or two, at least made it inside the house. But no, these idiot criminals were still in my backyard. So anyways, I go with my neighbor to my backyard with him carrying a gun, and the guys are there, to which my neighbor then proceeds to scream his ass off at them, pointing his gun at them, and telling them they have five seconds to get the fuck off the property, or he's going to blast them. Also, I wanted to mention that there was three of them, which I didn't know before while I was still in the house. They all then proceeded to book it out of the backyard, then got into their car and drove off. But not before my neighbor got their license plate, then called the cops on their asses. I'm still to this day so fucking grateful for my neighbor David for doing what he did for me that night, as I truly have no idea what would have happened to me if he didn't come help me. Side note. For anyone wondering why I didn't just call the cops myself that night, well, the reason's pretty simple. I didn't want to get my parents in any kind of trouble, or have them find out about that experience, and then I get in trouble. So, yeah, they still don't know that it happened, and my neighbor David hasn't said anything either. Thank God. Still, though, I cannot believe three strange men tried to kidnap a teenage boy. You usually hear about this stuff happening to girls very often, but boys? Not so much. Anyways, that's my story. I'm forever grateful to my neighbor David for helping me out that night. Seriously. Thank God for him. My story is a hard one to tell, but I really need to get it off my chest. My name is Alexander. I'm a 19-year-old male who's from a very rural county in Texas. My county was very large, however was full of farm fields and cattle, while also only having one little town inside, and it itself was very small. It's one of those towns that if you were to drive down the street, you would for sure see at least four to five people that you know. Anyway, Within our town, we had your stereotypical abandoned homes that everyone would claim different scary things to, such as ghosts, murders, etc. You know, the classics. Well, when I was 15, someone had bought and moved into one of these houses, and it really surprised the town, as this house in question was incredibly old. Like, it's literally been there since before the Civil War, and everyone thought that it would never be bought again. Yet, yeah, here's this guy that came out of nowhere and bought the house. My father being part of the mayor's office was very questionable about this man, as apparently after years later learning this, he had no identification with him, so it's pretty surprising to know that he somehow bought this house. Anyway, one night while my parents were on the couch, they told me that they were going west for a week and they were going to leave me home alone. I was really excited about this, 
as my girlfriend at the time and I were starting to get more intimate, and this was the perfect opportunity for us. Fast forward a couple of weeks and into the home alone a week itself, and I'm sitting on the couch watching TV. As I'm sitting there, I flip to the local news channel, and I see that an escaped convict who was wanted for breaking and entering, sexual assault, pedophilia, and murder, and he had been spotted a couple of months ago just a few counties over. My mind then immediately flashed to the guy that randomly appeared and moved to the old abandoned home. That's when I got a notification that someone was at the door from the Ring app. I went to the door and opened it to see my girlfriend. Her and I made some food and then proceeded to get intimate. I won't go into details, but it didn't take long before we went to my room. As we're, you know, doing this, I hear my phone go off, seeing another notification from the Ring app. I pretty much just ignored it, thinking it was just a deer or something since they're pretty common in the area. But then, we heard a knock at the door. We both shot up from the bed, thinking it was her parents, after then realizing it was almost 2 a.m. That's when I checked my phone, and in my horror, I saw the guy that lived in the abandoned home on the camera. He was just standing in front of the door, peering inside through the window on the top of the door frame. My girlfriend and I quickly got dressed, then moved into the living room. I stood in front of the door very quietly, and I began to listen. Now, when I tell you this guy was breathing really loud, I mean it. He was breathing loud, like so loud that I could actually hear it from the other side of the door. Then after a few minutes, he began to knock. The knocking then turned into banging after maybe a couple of seconds, and he began to scream that he knew we were there, and he then demanded us to open the door. That's when I then went into fight or fly mode, and I shuffled my girlfriend up the stairs. I then went into my dad's office, which was on the second floor, and I grabbed a handgun from the cabinet. My dad had taught me all about gun safety, so I knew what I was doing. I walked into my parents' room where my girlfriend was sitting, and she was absolutely bawling her eyes out at this point. I yelled at her to calm down and to call the police, and then go hide in my parents' closet. That's when we heard a window break downstairs, and then heard him scream. You two better hope I don't find you, because I'm gonna hurt the both of you, and I'm gonna make you watch. This alone told me the man's intentions, so I primed the handgun, and I pointed it right at the door, as my girlfriend was now calling the police. Just then, the door to my parents' room started to bang, as he was now trying to open it. I then screamed. I have a handgun pointed to the door. And if you don't leave right now, I'm going to pull the fucking trigger. The banging then stopped, and what followed scared the living shit out of me. The man then proceeded to laugh and then say, Good, I have one of my own. I aimed my weapon right at the door, and I was preparing myself. When I then heard the police sirens in the distance, I then heard the man on the other side quickly shuffle down the stairs and then out the door. The police arrived and questioned us and kept us company. My parents ended up flying home later that night and made a promise that they would never let this happen again. We moved not too long after that to Ohio, as my dad's company had an office in Columbus. The scary part, however, is after all these years, I decided to do some research and I learned that the man was never actually caught and that he was last seen on that night. I really hope that after what he did to me, he at least left the country, or he was finally killed trying to break into someone else's home. But even to the time I'm writing this, there's still really a part of me that really wishes I had pulled that trigger. I was 15 years old at the time of this story, and I'm a male. And for privacy reasons, I'll call myself Joe. My parents were going to be going on a two-day business trip, and they told me I was going to be home alone to watch the house. Well, after they left, I had called three of my friends letting them know and to see if they wanted to have a two-night sleepover at my place. We'll refer to two of them as Jake and Sammy. They came over at 8 p.m. that night, with my third friend telling me he couldn't come over. So anyways, Jake, Sammy, and I just did the normal regular things that friends do. We played video games, talked about things that were happening at school, 
etc. Well, right at around 11 o'clock at night, we had heard a knock on the door. We were all sleeping in the basement at the time. I have one of those houses with a backyard door in the basement. The curtains were closed, and I walked over and opened them, but I didn't see anything there. I then closed the curtains, and I just walked back to my friends. Then right after that, we heard yet another knock at the door. I opened the curtain yet again, this time seeing a guy standing right in front of the door, like he literally popped right in front of the door. In fear, I screamed and jumped back, and I told both of my friends to run upstairs with me. We all ran to my room, and we silenced our phones. I had texted my third friend who couldn't make it that night to see if he was pulling some kind of dark prank on us, but lo and behold, he wasn't. We then heard the front door creak open. We were all as silent as we could be when I heard what sounded like the man walking around my house. He had done this for a while, then he walks upstairs. We could all hear the sounds of the steps creaking while we're in the closet with the door closed when we then heard the bedroom door open. I then began whispering to my friends to hide. My closet luckily had a lot of clothes on the closet floor, as well as a junk of old toys that I used to play with as a kid. So we all hid behind and under my clothes, while also having the light off. Just then, the door began to be banged on, until it then finally flew open. I was literally right by the door when the man walked in, and I even saw a knife in his pants. After looking for a brief moment, he then took off, then back down the stairs and out of the front door of the house. I'm so thankful that he didn't spot us under all the clothes. Anyways, after he took off, I then immediately went for the phone and called 911. They eventually arrived, and the man had totally ransacked the house. There was furniture tipped over, as well as some of my parents' money that had actually been stolen. Obviously, my parents came home that same day, and they had to cancel their trip. They tried to comfort me, and they did what they could to make me feel better, but after that day, I never stayed home alone again. We did, however, find out who the culprit was in all this. We have cameras installed on our property, which I totally forgot to mention at the beginning of this story. So anyways, the culprit, you might ask? It was none other than one of our sketchy ass neighbors who was about to lose his house because he couldn't afford it anymore. So he got the bright idea to rob someone's house, which ended up being ours, I guess. He was caught that same day, and my parents pressed charges. I'm really glad we're all okay, but I will still always wonder what would have happened to us kids if he had actually found us in that closet. This happened back in 2016, and I'm still getting over all of the grief. I haven't really shared this story with anyone yet, but I finally decided to share it. I'm not even going to say where this happened for privacy reasons, even though I've since moved. I'm really afraid that the people related to those responsible might come after me. Anyway, at the time it happened, it was in August, and it was during the evening. My brother and I lived in a small two-bed, one-bath home that sat on 10 acres of land. It was what I once considered my dream home paradise. We had everything I could have ever wanted. A good amount of land, a two-car garage, a pole barn, and a nice view from our back deck. Now, here's some important details to note. The house itself was a basic square with the back deck on the southwest corner of the house. It was notched in the corner of the house with two walls on either side forming the corner of the house. You couldn't see around the house unless you bent over the railing, and you could only see the west and southwest away from the house. The garage was on the south side of the deck, which was only a few feet away from the deck, and the driveway leading to the garage was in front, so you couldn't see anyone coming up the driveway from the back of the house. Anyway, it was the evening. I was sitting on the back deck smoking a joint, and my brother was in his bedroom. I was just outside enjoying the weather and the peace and tranquility of the area. Suddenly, all of that was shattered when I then heard my brother shouting, followed by four loud gunshots. 
I immediately jumped up and I looked around the wall of the house towards the window of my brother's room, which faces the backyard. I looked just in time to see three masked men hopping out of the window. They appeared to be black and they looked like they were in their late 30s at least, but they were wearing masks so I couldn't really see their faces. One of them looked at me and froze, almost like he wasn't expecting me to be there. The three then turned and ran around the north wall of the house towards the front yard. I threw my joint out and I ran inside the house through the kitchen. I then went down the hall to my brother's bedroom. The door was open and I went inside. When I did so, I stopped dead in my tracks and my heart then froze. My blood went cold as ice. There on the bed was my brother. He was just laying there, facing up emotionless, with his eyes wide open, bleeding to death. Now, what I did next probably wasn't very smart, but I ran to the living room and I grabbed one of my guns. I threw open the front door just in time to see a blue Chevy Caprice peeling out of the driveway. I fired three shots at them, one missing, one hitting the car's tire, and one hitting the back window. I must have hit one of the guys inside because I had heard someone screaming from the car. Looking back, this probably wasn't a good idea to do since there was a house right across the street and I could very well could have accidentally shot the neighbor's house, but I wasn't really thinking that at the time. Anyway, the car sped off and I ran back inside. I grabbed some towels to try and go cover the wound on my brother's chest while also calling 911. While trying to cover up the wound, I was telling the dispatcher everything that happened, and I knew that my brother was already gone because he had no pulse when I checked, and he had three bullet holes in his chest, but I think I was just in disbelief at the time. Anyway, since this area has almost no crime rate, you can bet your ass that every sheriff and ambulance in the county was there in about 15 minutes. I had to explain to the detective that was there what happened while trying not to break down and crying. The sheriff and detective were both in disbelief too, since nothing like this had ever happened in the area in over 37 years. I'll spare you all the little details, but over the next three months, the investigation eventually wrapped up. And here's what I learned. After the police had gone through my brother's phone, they found that he had apparently been getting death threats. Apparently, he had been hitting on a girl that was a gang member's girlfriend. Apparently, the guy had warned my brother to stay away from her, and even after he did, I guess he decided that he still needed to get rid of my brother for good. Apparently, the night before he was killed, he had received a message from an unknown person, saying, I'm coming for you. Somehow, the guy found out where we lived and brought two guys with him to do the job. The strangest thing, though, as we lived 40 minutes away from the gang's territory, which was in the city. This guy was so aggravated at my brother that he drove himself and two other guys 40 minutes out into the countryside just to kill him. It really amazes me just how far this guy was willing to go just to make sure nobody ever went near his girlfriend. Now let me tell you what happened to those three guys. One of them was the one that I had shot as the car pulled out of the driveway and he apparently died while in the car. The other guy who was along for the job was caught during a traffic stop. Apparently, he was dumb enough to take that same car out the next day, and there was an alert out for it. Now, since there aren't that many sky blue Chevy Caprices left, it was pretty easy to find. He was arrested, and he was charged with murder, and since the prosecutors where the murder happened are way more strict, he was sentenced to death. The guy who orchestrated this whole thing was actually killed in another shooting in his own city the following week. Yeah, pretty crazy how karma gets to you. I think they all got what they deserved in the end, in my opinion anyways. I did have to go to court for the guy I shot because he had no family apparently, and due to some other circumstances, I didn't go to jail. I did get a hefty fine though for dangerous use of a firearm probably due to the fact that I could have accidentally shot my neighbor's house, and I had to take a gun training class after that. But I didn't care. For almost a year after this all happened, I didn't do anything except mope around my house, 
and I barely even left the house at all. I never even went into my brother's room after that. I just left the door to it closed so I wouldn't be tempted to look in it. I was so devastated by what happened that I nearly lost interest in everything. I ended up just packing up all my things and moving out shortly after. I just couldn't stand to be there anymore, nor did I feel safe there anymore after what happened. My brother and I were really close, and to lose a loved one so tragically and suddenly in your own home is devastating. It was sad because I really loved that house and my brother. I honestly thought it would be our forever home, but I just couldn't stand to be there anymore. I moved eight hours away, and I haven't been back to that house since, and I honestly don't think I ever will. I do still own the house and the land. I just don't think I can ever go back. And even though I moved, I still won't ever forget that evening and everything that happened. I'm doing a little better now, and I have someone else living with me, but I'll definitely be scarred for life for that event. I was never really a deep sleeper, which is a good thing, especially after this night, and it's one of the best qualities I'm happy about. It was a cold November night. My family were out of town, and I had the house all to myself besides the dog who I was taking care of at the time. I had fallen asleep in my room at 11 p.m. Well, it was around 2 in the morning when I heard a loud crash sound coming from downstairs. I checked my alarm clock, and it was 2.12 a.m. I yawned and got out from my bed, and I then stood up, walking towards the door. I had heard the floor's thud, as if someone was walking around. I slowly opened my door, but stopped as I then heard footsteps starting to walk down the hallway, which was right outside my bedroom door. I had gotten really scared that I'd be seen, as I then quietly prayed and quietly shut the door. The person had stopped right outside my bedroom door, and they kind of just waited. It must have been hours before I'd heard the movement again, but in reality, it was just minutes. I heard the footsteps start to go down the steps. I opened the door, and I quickly made my way to the steps, but saw nothing. I heard the door shut, and I quickly looked out the window closest to the steps to then see the driveway but I saw nobody outside. I did happen to live near a graveyard, so paranormal activity couldn't always be ruled out, but I had no idea what this was. I took several deep breaths, and I decided the best thing I could do was lock my front door and go back to bed. I woke up the next morning going over all the events of last night in my head. There were no windows smashed in the entire house, so I'm still not sure what that loud noise was that woke me up. I know this may sound messed up, but I had kind of chalked it up to paranormal activity. A spirit must have come into my house last night. It's not a very comfortable feeling or thought, but at least it's better than a person. But hear me out. When I walked towards the back door, my heart nearly stopped at what I saw. I then saw footprints from a boot, and the back door I'd forgotten to lock last night had been quietly opened with a lockpick. So yeah, this wasn't a supernatural occurrence like I originally thought. This was a home invasion attempt. I'm just really glad I never got hurt in the process. This happened in October, so it was pretty spooky. Now, my apartment is at the bottom corner of my building. I was watching a league of their own, the TV series, and I was on Skype with my friend in my kitchen table. I had noticed a shadow in the blinds in my living room window. I chalk it up to just being me, as I wasn't too sure of the lighting in my apartment at the time. About 20 minutes go by, and I see the same shadow. Mine, right? Sure. Let's go with that. About 5 minutes later, I hear a very loud cough. I then said to myself, hold the fuck up, I was alone. There's no reason it should have been sounding like it's the same room as me. Instinctually, I turn to the window and I see the same shadow. I move around a little bit 
and it stays absolutely still. When it clicks in my head, what the fuck's happening? I grab a pair of scissors I had sitting on my table from a project. I get up slowly, and I then bulldoze through my living room right towards my window. I slap my blinds out of the way as I was then screaming, I will literally gut you from armpit to asshole. When I then come face to face with an old scraggly methed out man for maybe two seconds, which felt like an eternity. He turned around and scampered towards either my bedroom window or the side entrance of my building, but I didn't stick around to find out. I then ran to the only room in my apartment without a window, my bathroom. I hid in the dark and had a full-blown panic attack as I called the police. They came and searched the whole area, and they took my statement. After searching for the man, the one officer then told me that the man was gone or hiding. I replied, Aw, he's hiding. That's just perfect. The building security team told me to call them if I needed anything, and to maybe stay out of my apartment for the night. But the story doesn't stop there. One week later, I was entering my building with one of my friends, who was spending the weekend with me. There was an old man by the entrance that then greeted me, as if he knew me. My blood ran cold. I politely and nervously greeted him, and kept walking away, leaving my friend confused. I called the building security team to then let them know that the same man came back. I got a call from security a few moments later. Apparently that same man was a resident of the building, and just so happened to slightly look like the man that was at my window. But after checking the cameras, the security gave me a more exact description of the man that was after me. Anyway, that whole experience really horrified me. I had hid in my bathroom for a number of hours, and I didn't go into my bedroom and get a shit night's sleep until I figured out how to black out my window with my blanket. I just wanted to eat my chicken nuggets and enjoy my show. Why did this have to happen? This story isn't as crazy as others you may typically hear, but I still feel it's necessary to put this one out there. So here we go. This incident occurred during October of 2020. My mom invited her cousin over to play some cards. They played for a pretty long time. It was 4 a.m. when my mom's cousin decided to finally leave. My mom volunteered to walk her to her car for safety. While her cousin was pulling out, my mom had spotted the sketchy looking man walking by her home. He was on the older side, bald, and he was wearing all black. She didn't think too much of it, so she came back inside and made sure that everything was locked. My mom had later woke me up to tell me that she had finally stopped playing and that she was now getting ready for bed. My sleep was broken, so I decided to get on my phone until I drifted back off. A few minutes later, I heard a banging noise coming from the backyard. I was a bit confused because I knew my dad was still asleep, and there was no way he was in the backyard. I didn't even care to look out the window, which is something that I regret to this day. My mom, however, well, she found it strange as well, and she looked out the kitchen window. The minute she looked out, she saw a strange man trying to break into our shed with a crowbar. When they locked eyes, my mom then realized that it was the same man she saw walking past our home just minutes ago. She immediately started cursing him out and shouting at him to get off our property, and she did so in the most intimidating tone. This made me and the rest of our family jump out of all of our beds. My dad was quick to come out with his gun, while me and my mom then grabbed a weapon. We hopped in my dad's truck, and then drove around the entire neighborhood looking for the man. Unfortunately, we didn't find him, so we just came back home, and we all just processed what just happened. We were all a bit shocked, because we had never experienced anything like this before. But the story doesn't end here. Fast forward to the weekend. My parents were coming home from a short trip, when all of a sudden, she had spotted that same man standing in a field taking selfies. He actually had the nerve to carelessly show his face in an area where he attempted to steal from. My mom then told my dad to stop the truck so she can get a good look at him first. 
When she then confirmed that it was indeed him, my dad got out of the car and confronted the man. The man looked shocked, and he nervously declined that it wasn't him, as he then ran off, avoiding any more conversation. That was enough, as my dad ran behind the guy and then punched him. My mom was so furious that she was about to hit the man with the truck, but thank God my dad stopped her. My dad then told the man, If you ever come back to our house and try and steal from us again, I promise I'll kill you. My dad decided to give the neighbors a heads up about the thief on our street. The neighbors stated that their sheds were broken into as well, and also had missing objects. I'm just really glad the man wasn't as successful when it came to our property. Before I go, I just want to let others know, if you ever hear any suspicious noise inside or outside your home, don't hesitate to look. You never know what's going on. Thank you for listening to my story, and please be safe out there. At the time, I was practicing self-defense training. I live with my mom and dad and my two other siblings, which are boys. Now, my dad wasn't home at the time because he had a late shift, and my little cousin came over to visit. She was about 8 to 9 years old, and my siblings are 12 and 8, and I'm 16. I was going to go open the gate for my cousin, until I then saw a guy walk up to the gate. I quickly looked at him since I then sensed that something was fishy about him. It was the way he walked, and his eyes were bloodshot red. The man proceeded to shout at me, telling me to open our gate and let him in. I told my cousin to run and call my mom while I tried to defuse the man from doing anything crazy. But unfortunately, however, he climbed our gate and then tried running into our house. I don't know why he didn't attack me, but I ran after him. The guy had actually managed to enter our house. My mom saw the guy in the house and she tried kicking him out, but he wasn't budging. She then proceeded to shout at me for opening it for him. I told her I did it and that he jumped the gate. I then ran to my siblings and little cousin and I locked them in my parents' room to keep them safe, all while my mom and that random psycho were arguing. After that, I went to go grab a kitchen knife and that's where my self-defense training comes in. I ran to the man, and I slashed him on the arm with the knife. I slashed him twice, but he still didn't budge. I don't know what he was on about, but he really took the hit, and he wasn't even acting like he was in pain. My mom then tells me to go get the dog. Now, I have a really big dog, and she's a pit bull. She's not very friendly, so for my mom to tell me to open up for her, it scared me the fuck out. I opened for the dog, and then she proceeded to tackle the man and rip at him. I don't know how, but he managed to escape after that. My mom then immediately called my dad, and I put up the dog. I then went to unlock the door for my siblings and cousin to come back out. We never did end up calling the police about it, because the police in our area don't really do anything about the issues that happen. Although the story is not that scary, it really fucked me up badly. I now carry a knife with me anywhere I go, and I would advise you carry something as well just for your own protection. Please everyone, be safe out there, and I really pray and hope nothing like this ever happens again. This took place when I was around 6 or 7. My parents were out late at a bar. My older sister, who was around 14 to 15 at the time, was watching me. We were in the living room watching TV, and it was fairly late, around 10 to 11 p.m. We had lived in a nice neighborhood at the time. Police never had to come or deal with lots of issues. It was low crime rate and great schools. We were both dozing off, when suddenly, it sounded like somebody was trying to aggressively open our door. I guess if someone was being chased and they were desperate for shelter, pounding on the glass, jiggling the doorknob, and ringing the doorbell all at the same time, and very aggressively. It lasted for about 10 to 15 seconds, and then it stopped abruptly. My sister made me go to the front door and see if it was our mom or dad, possibly drunk, coming home. It wasn't. 
There was no one there when I checked. Freaking out, we called our parents, who were only a little concerned but said they were on their way. I remember us running upstairs and locking ourselves in my room since my downstairs floor was full of giant windows that we left the curtains open to. Fifteen minutes later, it happened again. Pounding on the door, trying the doorknob, and non-stop rapidly ringing of the doorbell. I was hoping that it was a ding-dong ditcher the first time, but twice? I feel like you wouldn't want to go back to the home in fear of the cops being called on you or having someone looking out for you. I don't know, though. My sister called my parents yet again, who were still on their way home. We were both way too terrified to check the door. It stopped abruptly yet again. I don't know why my sister didn't just call the cops herself. My parents finally got home. They still didn't know if it was worth calling the cops or not, and fear of it ending up just being a waste of time. Obviously, my parents aren't very smart, I know. And since they weren't there, they didn't hear how crazy it sounded. It wasn't just a knock and a doorbell ring. Whoever was on the other side of that door was putting what sounded like all of their strength into trying to get into our house. We all eventually just went to bed, my mom reassuring us that it wouldn't happen again. 3 a.m. rolls around, and obviously it happens again. This time was the most aggressive. My mom screamed at my dad to call 911, which he did do while running down the stairs to see who it was. Then it stopped. My dad got to the door about five seconds after it stopped, and again, nobody was there. The cops patrolled our house that night and drove around the neighborhood for a few days after those incidents. From what I know, Nobody else had reported something like this happening to them in our neighborhood. I still don't know what it could have been about. I've always told myself it was just some kids messing with us, but the fact that it happened multiple times and so aggressively really disturbs me. I had some trouble sleeping in that house for months. If you wanted a ding-dong ditch, why would you try to open the door relentlessly? And why target the same house three times? That just seems like a lot. God knows what would have happened if the door was unlocked. We were little girls, and we definitely wouldn't have been able to defend ourselves had it been malicious. Our cars were broken into just a few months after this, so it's very possible that it could have been related. I'll never really know, but whether it was innocent or not, whoever it was that desperately wanted to get into our house that night... I want to thank you for the lifelong trauma of being home alone. Thanks for that. My house is weird, and that we have skylights in the living room. And this is the weird part. The bathroom as well. Which is also a big issue. We've caught a drone, one with a camera hovering over them for an extended period of time. A lot of the time being when I'm in the house alone, even at times when I've just gotten out of the shower. We aren't sure though whether they're actually watching me then, but we hope not. There's been a lot of strange happenings around my house over the past few years, ever since October of 2020. Not supernaturally strange, that wouldn't quite be so scary. After all, humans can be far more cruel than any ghost or ghoul. One night, though, someone had snuck up to put a note by our door. The note was essentially telling us to get rid of Garamo, our pit bull who's somewhat of a watchdog. He stopped a lot of bad things from escalating. Another night, we caught someone creeping around our house and looking through our windows. We suspect that it's been one person that's doing all this, because it seems a bit strange that all of this suddenly started happening after years of being in our house with nothing strange happening. My parents have been particularly concerned about my safety in all of this, thinking that someone might be targeting or watching me. I remember thinking when they told me this, great, I just love being a teenage girl. This all leads up to about a year ago, when I was home with nobody else except for my father, who was in his room. I was laying in the living room on the couch, and I was faced away from the front door which was right behind me. I was cuddling with my dogs and listening to scary stories, which is sort of funny considering what happened. 
and at the time, I was planning on taking a nap. Aside from the voice of the narrator on the TV and the soft sound of my dog's breathing, it was quiet, and then it happened. Suddenly, I heard the moaning of the hinges of the glass door then opening as my dogs then lunged off the sofa. Guillermo was jumping at the door now excitedly and barking, sounding nearly vicious. I heard the actual door being twisted open behind me as I was faced away, assuming it was one of my family members just coming home. Roxy, who's the other dog, a blue healer, had returned to my side and began cowering by my feet. She's a very anxious dog. This wasn't out of the ordinary at all, so I didn't even question it. Not until I realized that nobody was actually coming into our house. About 40 seconds went by, but I didn't once see or hear the voices of my siblings or mother. I remember thinking how weird that was. They would have usually greeted me, or I would have at least seen them walking past me into the house. But no. Guillermo was still sitting at the door, and when I turned around to look, there was no one there. Not my brother, not my sister, and not my mom. No one. Finally, I stood up, going to check out my brother's room to check if he was home. Nope. So I went to my parents' room right next to it, wanting to see if my mother came home. Nope. But my father was still sat right there. So I asked him, Hey dad, did you hear the door opening? He looked up at me, looking slightly confused. Yeah, wasn't that you? No, I thought mom or Beth came home. I told him. I was feeling sort of nervous now. Your mother doesn't get off until 9.30 and your sister's staying at Tim's. He told me. Tim is my sister's boyfriend, by the way. But my brother was clearly not home. The bathroom was empty, and he wasn't in his room. So who, I wondered, opened the door? Did it really even open at all? Dad, can you come to the door with me? I asked him anxiously. He was clearly concerned by the situation. We were always so vigilant about locking the door. Nobody but our family should have been able to just get in. But we both heard the door opening clear as day, and we were still the only two people at home. So what happened? My father led the way, with me trailing close behind. We went down the short hallway and right into the living room. We noticed quickly, as we approached the door, that it was slightly ajar. Someone had opened it. We knew that it was closed before. I heard the doorknob twist when it opened. Someone tried to get into our house while I was sitting right there. We learned later on that when my brother came home, he forgot to lock the door behind him when he left, but it was still strange. The one time we left the door unlocked, someone tried to break in. There's been a few more instances of someone creeping around our house and also us seeing the same drone since then. Recently, a guy came up to our house in the middle of the night, and when my dad confronted him, he asked if he could take Guillermo for a walk. We very obviously didn't let him. We're still very suspicious of him. Nothing happened again with someone trying to get in, but we've still been cautious. We keep a closer eye on our dogs whenever they go out. We always double check the locks, and we now have blurring sheets on our skylights, and we're going to be getting cameras soon as well. There's nothing about my family in specific that made any of this happen. We are, for the most part, very normal, just like any other household. This sort of thing can really happen to anyone. People can be awful, and while it's awful to think about, you really aren't safe from things like that. So please be careful. This event happened to me about a month ago. I was meeting up with my ex-girlfriend for my 17th birthday, and we were having a good time just driving around and rebonding, just catching up with each other. We decided to go to her house to hang out since she was home alone, but I'll let it be known now that she doesn't live in the best area, and it's known for being in the hood, I guess you can say. So we're just laying down together watching the show Catfish, when we then heard the door then aggressively open. 
We just assumed it was her sister coming home from work or something, but then we heard a lot of noise coming from the living room. I had just slightly opened the door, and I saw two guys wearing masks just walking around the house, so I slightly closed the door so they wouldn't hear us. I told my ex what was going on, and she panicked, which then led to the guys rushing to the room. They started pounding on the door, then saying, Open the fucking door! Luckily, I had locked it just in time. They tried knocking down the door, screaming and going apeshit crazy. I had to think fast, so I then had my ex and I then escape through a bedroom window. We started booking it, running like our lives depended on it, while also pulling out a phone to call 911. We stayed away from the house, but just far enough to still be able to keep an eye on it for when the cops would arrive. After the cops got there, we went to the house to talk to the officers. But what do you know? The intruders were long gone at that point, but they did find a pocket knife left on the floor and some duct tape as well. I'm really glad my ex and I got out of there when we did, because I really have no clue what those guys would have done to us. I'd like to end this story with a big fuck you to the bitch-ass intruders who did all this. Thank you for ruining my birthday and robbing my ex's house and her family. Sooner or later, you broke-ass bitches are going to end up in jail. Or worse. So I really hope it was worth it. The story took place last summer when I was 17 years old. My boyfriend, who we'll call E, asked me to hang out while he was babysitting his little brother, who we'll call A. Over the summer, E's mom and stepdad had date nights somewhat frequently, and I came over a lot to help and hang out. This was done with no worries, as although we lived in a very nice area by the beach, we lived in one of the safer areas in the community. They left at 5.30pm, and for the first few hours, it was pretty uneventful. Me and E made dinner, we all ate, played a few board games, watched some cartoons, and then we put A to bed by 8. After that, me and E were cuddled up on the couch watching some TV. Right at around 9, E had a sudden craving for frozen yogurt, which didn't really surprise me, as it was his favorite dessert. We didn't want to wake up his brother, so I agreed to stay while we went to go get us some. I knew it was going to take him about 20 to 30 minutes round trip, as he would have to go down more towards the beach. About five minutes after he left, I had heard a knock on the door. As I was walking up to the door, I had heard a man's voice then shout, Hey, I got a pizza here! He had a friendly tone, but I didn't want to open the door, as I knew the pizza wasn't ordered. I went to the little library slash office area of the house, which also had a window facing the front door. Very carefully, I peeped out the window. Looking out to the street, I saw no car with any type of pizza logo. What was worse was the fact that the man wasn't even holding anything. I had no intentions of finding out what this sketchy dude wanted, especially with a six-year-old child in the house. So I decided to just wait it out, figuring that he wouldn't want to stay there forever. Not even five minutes go by, and I started to hear movement. I was getting more irritated than scared, ready to deal with this creep. However, I became a lot more nervous as I then saw the man sneaking into the backyard, and now a sense of realness coming over me. Before calling the police, I had messaged my boyfriend, only to find out that he had conveniently left his phone on the couch. I quickly called 911, running down the hall to A's room, before then pausing for a brief second. While giving 911 the address and the situation, I ran back two doors to E's room to get an aluminum baseball bat that he had. Usually I wouldn't be too worried about defending myself. At my high school, I'm on the wrestling team, and I also frequent the gym, so I can definitely say that I'm stronger than most teenage girls, but I knew that a weapon was going to serve a lot better defense. As I quietly crept back to A's room, I heard the last thing that I wanted to hear. You see, all of the entrances at my boyfriend's house has those coded locks. It made a specific beeping sound when the correct code was punched. Imagine my surprise and horror 
When I then heard that exact sound, I then hauled ass to A's room, quietly shutting and locking his door in an attempt not to wake him up. I felt helpless, as all I could really do was notify 911 about what happened and just sit against the door. I could now hear this man wandering throughout the house and then walking into different rooms. I silently prayed that either E or the police would come before he came around to A's door. Unfortunately, the man wasted no time, and I then heard the doorknob then begin rattling. Although it was slightly muffled, I could hear the man say, I know that there's a pretty girl in there. After no response, he began banging on the door like a maniac. The operator told me to sit tight, as the police were almost there. Of course, A woke up, and I then rushed to him, desperately telling him to keep quiet. Fortunately, he did as I asked, although it didn't surprise me, as he was always a quiet kid, never really fussy or super loud. The man kept banging on the door, even shouting to let him in, and that I'm going to regret not opening the door. A hugged me tightly, and I hugged him back, not knowing if I was serving him more comfort or vice versa. After what felt like my whole life and back, the police made their way into the house. I could hear the man struggling as they arrested him, and an officer then telling us it was safe to come out. I told A that I was super proud of him for how he handled the situation, carrying him out while unlocking the door. We walked out to the front yard, and the first thing I saw was E talking to another officer. He saw us, and he immediately hugged both of us, then causing me to almost topple over. He was bombarding the both of us with kisses, while repeating, Thank God, which made me feel a whole lot better. The officer pulled me aside for questioning, and E called both his mom and mine as well. The whole situation was a bit of a blur, but apparently E's stepdad identified the man as his co-worker. They work in home security, which explains how he was able to unlock the door. He refused to reveal his motives to the police, but in all honesty, I had no interest in even knowing. Both my parents and E's press charges, and I know I won't ever have to deal with that creep ever again. I'm really happy to say that me and E are still together. We're going to be moving into an apartment in the fall, as both of the universities we're attending are actually in the same state. Fortunately, A doesn't remember much from that night. Although I don't let that night haunt me, I will definitely never forget it. This happened about four years ago, way before COVID and all that. My friend and I had arranged plans for us to watch a movie at a movie theater on a Friday night. I don't really remember what we were watching, but all I know was that the theater was completely empty besides one guy and a few other people. The lights had dimmed for the movie to start, and maybe about 30 minutes in, I had to use the bathroom really bad. I thought that I could hold it, but my body apparently told me otherwise. I told my friend to I'll refer to as Chris that I had to go use the restroom, but to give me a brief summary of what I missed when I came back. I then left the theater into the long, dark, crimson-colored hallway. About halfway to the bathroom, I had noticed someone in my peripheral vision. I looked back for a quick glance, and I realized it was the guy that I'd mentioned earlier. I didn't think much as I assumed he just needed to use the restroom too. I went into a bathroom stall and did my business when I heard a quiet knock at the door to the stall. Then another one much louder. Um, someone's in here, I said in a shaky tone. The knock suddenly stopped and the sounds of footsteps filled the air, but it didn't get any quieter. I peered under the stall and to my surprise, I saw a set of feet in front of it. Um, I can see you, I said. I got really quiet halfway through my sentence that I regretted saying, and I heard an angry grunt. I didn't know what to do. I could now feel sweat in my palms, and I could hear the shakiness of my own breath. I finally built up the courage, though, to open up the door. When I did... I heard the sound of someone's head smacking into the door of the stall. I then ran to the theater and I told Chris about what happened. 
We decided to just toughen it out and just try and finish the movie. But I couldn't really enjoy any of it since the man walked back into the theater and was now staring at me. I felt so uneasy and I had contemplated on just straight up leaving the theater. Maybe 30 minutes later, the credits showed. Chris and I got up and hurried the hell out of there. As I was beginning to describe what had happened more in depth, I saw the same man yet again, this time right next to us, and he was smiling at us. Man, what the hell do you want? I asked, no longer afraid at this point. The man then just tilted his ugly head back and started to chuckle loudly. By this time, people had started to pass us and hurried out of there due to the laughter. Chris and I just speed walked while I kept looking back at the man. He had then actually followed us out into the parking lot. I turned around to find the keys in my pocket. What happened next actually felt like a dream. I then got punched really hard in my back. I collapsed to the floor and then got back up. Chris started to tackle the man and then shove his body into the ground. I decided to call 911 at this point and I had explained to the operator everything that happened. It only took about five minutes for the police to arrive, but it felt like an eternity. Apparently, a quick background check revealed what this man was probably going to do to me. This man had a history for robbing people and then badly beating them up. He was then promptly arrested after this. To this day, I don't ever go anywhere without having pepper spray or a pocket knife on me. It might not seem that scary, but when it happens to you, it really feels like the day it happens will be your last on earth. Thank God that wasn't the case though. Before I narrate this story, I need you all to know this first. The story is allegedly from a survivor of the July 20th, 2012 mass shooting that happened in Aurora, Colorado during the midnight screening of the film The Dark Knight Rises. I know you've all heard of it. I need to mention that I do not know for sure if this story is 100% true or not, as the person who sent this story didn't include any email or any other sources besides the story itself. So if you don't want to believe it, I completely understand. However, this event really did happen, and so many people died this day. So please be respectful in the comments section. Now that all of that's out of the way, let's begin. It was July 20th, 2012, and I still remember every single detail. My little sister and I went to the mall to celebrate her 11th birthday. While we were walking around, she asked if we could go see a movie. Since it was our day celebrating, I eventually gave in. Thankfully, our favorite movie theater was right across the mall parking lot. I texted my mom letting her know that we're going to be home a little bit later tonight. I remember walking into the theater, and I had started to ask her what movie she wanted to see. But she then screamed when she saw the new Batman movie was out. Dark Knight Rises. I guess I didn't really need to finish my question for her. So we got to the ticket booth, and I asked for two tickets to the Dark Knight Rises and she was jumping up and down with excitement. We went and got our popcorn, and she wanted five different candies, but I couldn't refuse because it was her birthday. We ran down the hallway trying not to miss any of the trailers. I turned off my phone, and the lights then started to dim. My sister and I put our chairs back, and I remember there being a hole in my chair, and I couldn't help but fiddle with the loose leather. The only thing I couldn't tell you is just how long it took me to notice that there was a man in a weird mask standing right in front of the theater. It really gave me a weird feeling, and I told my sister to switch seats with me, since I was much closer to the exit. Then out of nowhere, the guy threw something into the rows of seats, and it started smoking. I started to get very, very nervous, and I grabbed my sister's hand, and I then whispered for her to get onto the floor. She then looked at me like I was crazy, but I yanked on her arm even harder, and then she followed me. The next thing I know, I hear a loud pop, and it didn't stop. I knew what that sound was all too well. My dad had taught me when I was very young about handling guns, 
and once you hear an automatic gun in close proximity, you never forget it. My sister screamed along with everyone else, and I then started crawling to be on top of her torso. Screams turned to cries that were then muffled by loud gunshots. I saw blood coming down from the level above us, and I told my sister to close her eyes. I heard people trying to run away, but he was by the emergency exit, and no one could get past him. It all just felt like forever, and then complete silence. My sister tried to get up, but I put all my weight on her, trying to tell her not to move and to stay quiet. I had heard popcorn being crushed like someone was walking on it, and everything just started to slow down. I could hear my breathing. I could hear my sister sobbing under me. I could even hear the gurgle of people who had been shot. Finally, the footsteps stopped, and I had pinked in between the theater chairs to then see that he was gone. I got off my sister, and I told her to keep her head down, stay close, and don't look anywhere but at my back. We slowly moved down the aisle, and there were bodies everywhere. Some of the people looked at me while we passed. I really wanted to help, but my sister was my number one priority. I let her out of the theater, and then back to the exit. I guess the other people had the same idea because there were trails of blood everywhere. Once we cleared out of the theater, I then just screamed at her to run. I put her down next to a car in the parking lot and waited. We finally saw blue and red lights and without warning, I just started sobbing uncontrollably. I remember grabbing my phone out of my pocket and turning it back on. There were two missed calls from my mom. I called her and all I could get out was please help. We both just waited there watching the police swarm the other side of the building, and I saw my mom's car pull up to where we were at. She got out of the car and then ran to us. She just started screaming over and over, asking if we're hurt. I hadn't really realized it before, but we both had blood on our legs and sides. It was all over us. After what seemed like hours of questioning, we finally got home, and it was all over the news. A man proclaiming he was the Joker shooting up the theater. Still to this day, I wonder what would have happened if I didn't turn my phone off and my mom had called in the middle of this. Would he have looked for where it came from? Would he have stayed any longer? All I know for sure is I haven't been able to step my foot back into a theater since, and I honestly don't know if I ever will. If any of you happen to doubt my story, just Google the Aurora, Colorado shooting and you'll find it. When I was 14, I had gotten invited by a longtime guy friend who will call Jay to go to the movies with him and an older friend of his. This is where my mom and I lived. Let's call the older friend Patrick. I had to bring one of my female friends, Sarah, along as well. Jay was 15, Sarah and I 14, and Patrick 18. Now, Patrick and I clicked pretty much immediately. But at the movies that night, our little group left the movie theater in the middle of the movies to go and have a cigarette. Pretty much all of us smoked except for Sarah. We sat outside around the corner so that the adults wouldn't see us. To paint a picture, Sarah and I were sitting cross-legged on the ground, and the two guys were just standing. The shady guy had appeared, and he had asked us for cash, but in a non-threatening tone. We just told him, Sorry bro, but we really don't have any. We're just kids. We use the last of our cash on our movie tickets. The guy then responded back with, Oh, okay. Well, do you mind giving me a smoke then? I could really use it and one of the guys gave him one. We expected this guy to then be on his way after that, but he just kept standing there. There was an awkward silence, and we kind of just looked at him with, um, why are you still here, kind of looks. Then out of nowhere, the guy drew out a knife, and he told us all to hand over our wallets and purses. The two guys then bolted, and I got up from where I was sitting, going after the guys, thinking that Sarah would do the same. But mid-run, I then realized that she wasn't behind me, 
and I had turned around to run back to her. When I got back to her, the guy was pinning her against the wall, and I had then shouted at him, storming at him. He then grabbed her back and ran off. I know that this was stupid, but I gave chase, but he ended up jumping a fence at the dead end of the alley. When I turned around, suddenly Patrick was now back in the picture again. He asked me if I was crazy for chasing that guy down on my own, but luckily in the end, no one got hurt, and the thief only ended up getting a hairbrush and a bunch of bank cards that he can't even use. My name is Karen. I'm 40 years old now, and this happened when I was 15, and I can still remember it like it happened yesterday. I was a very petite 15-year-old girl. My boyfriend was about six foot, and he made me feel safe. We had decided to go to the movies. Now, our cinemas here have one fat row right down the center, and then skinny rows down either side. I haven't really traveled that much, so I'm not really sure if it's the same everywhere else. Anyway, my boyfriend and I sat in the fat row in the center. I sat one seat from the aisle to my right, with my boyfriend on the left. There were only about six people scattered throughout the whole cinema, everyone giving each other their space, as it was an almost empty room. About 30 to 45 minutes after the movie starts, a man by himself comes in and sits in the same row as us and next to the aisle, so basically he's one seat and an aisle away from me. It really annoyed me at first as I thought to myself, dude, you have the whole theater to choose from. Why do you gotta sit so close to me? But I just kept watching the movie. Then I noticed that he doesn't actually sit there and watch the movie. He puts his arms up and then folds them on the seat in front of him. Then he lays his head on the sides of his arms and just stares at me. I really try not to notice it and just ignore him. I keep watching the movie, but he doesn't look away. I think that this lasts for about five minutes, but I'm not really sure, but it felt like forever. It could have been two or ten. I stopped paying attention to the movie. I then whispered to my boyfriend, Hey, have you seen this dude sitting there staring at me? He then just says, Yeah, why don't you sit on the other side of me? So I get up, and I precisely do that. Now my boyfriend's to my right, and there's two seats in the aisle, then this freaky ass dude. Now, when I swap seats, I don't look at him. I don't do anything but just stare at the movie. I wait a few minutes, and without looking at my boyfriend or moving my head, I then ask, So, is he still staring at me? And my boyfriend replies, No. As soon as you change seats, he got up and left. Needless to say, I didn't really pay much attention to the rest of the movie. When we left, I was shaking and staring in every corner on the way to our car, expecting to see some kind of lurking shadow. I'm so freaked out and instead of going home, we decided to go to my stepbrothers to get stoned. It had took me about an hour or two to calm down. I just wish I had actually seen his face where I knew who he was, because it's something that's freaked me out for ages. I know this doesn't sound that scary, but I really had no idea what this guy's intentions were. I honestly thought that he was going to try and attack me in the theater, but I'm really glad it didn't go that far. This happened back in April in 2018. I had went to the movie theater all alone for the midnight showing of the Avengers movie, Infinity War. I usually wait until the lobby is completely empty before I buy myself a snack and a drink. As I was filling up my cup at the soda fountain, a man came up beside me and had asked, Hey, are you here for Infinity War? I politely replied with, Yeah, I've been ready to see it for a while. And he just smiled back, saying nothing else. He just stared at me. He then said with a teeth-showing grin, Well... I hope you enjoy the movie, and walked away. Okay, that was fucking weird, I said to myself. It was about 2.30 to 3 a.m. at this point, 
when I finally got out of the movie theater. I usually go to the restroom until the place empties out. I have severe social anxiety. Well, I always park near the exit of this theater because the parking is absolutely terrible. It was completely empty when I started walking to my car and I started hearing a faint whistle in the near distance. The theater in question is right next to about eight acres of nothing but trees. That's exactly where the whistling was coming from and my car was parked right next to it. The whistling grew louder as I then got closer to my vehicle. I was on full alert as I got up to my vehicle. Before I could unlock my door, I then hear footsteps and whistling, now right behind me. I turned around as fast as I could, and there he was. It was the man who came up to me before at the soda fountain right before the movie, and he was standing just inches away from me, with the same deranged smile that he had earlier. Now, I'm a 5'3 girl. This man had to be around 6'4 to 6'5, and he was nearly twice my weight. He grabbed me by the hair and then smacked my head right against the driver's side door. That's all I could remember before then waking up. This next part is horrifying. When I woke up, I was in the back seat of my own car with nothing but a pair of socks on. My vision was blurry but I could barely see that the man was now inside a gas station talking to the cashier. The key was still in the ignition, so I dragged myself to the driver's seat, shifted the vehicle, and got the hell out of there. I must have been driving for around an hour before I finally realized that it was almost 7 a.m. at this point. I drove to my mom's house, and I had a complete mental breakdown, telling her everything that happened, or what I knew of. She took me to the hospital, because without even realizing it, I noticed that I was bleeding from my genital area, and I had gashes all over my abdomen, and my right eye was completely swollen shut. So as it turns out, the guy had knocked me out, and then sexually assaulted me in my car, and when I woke up, he was in the gas station, which now led me to where we're at now in the story. I ended up being admitted to the hospital, and they did a bunch of tests on me. A couple of police officers came in and talked to me. I gave them a statement, and I thanked them profusely for trying their best to figure everything out. So as I stated before, all of this happened in April of 2018. It's been years, and I've never heard anything else about what happened, nor has the man been caught. No arrests at all have been made but two more girls have been sexually assaulted right around that area since. So to that awful, disgusting man who took away my sanity that night and raped me, I really hope you burn in hell. I'm a 20-year-old male. I live in a small, quiet town in the state of Ohio. One day I decided that I wanted to go camping in the woods because I'm an outdoors type of person and I could really use the fresh air. My girlfriend Tiffany wasn't too thrilled at the idea, so I went alone. Fast forward to a day later, and I had made it to the woods and found a really nice clearing in the shape of a circle that was surrounded by trees. It seemed like the perfect place to set up my camp. As I was setting up my tent, I thought that I heard footsteps off in the distance. I shrugged my shoulders, thinking it was just another camper nearby, and I went back to setting up my tent. There's a lake not too far from where my camp was, so I went over to the lake with my fishing pole, and I started fishing. After I was done, I began walking back to my camp, and that's when I noticed something that I didn't notice before. There was a poster of a missing girl. She had blonde curly hair and blue eyes, and she had a huge smile on her face. The poster read, Have you seen this girl? After reading the poster, I had an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I put my hand on my stomach and began walking back to my camp. A few hours later, the sun began to set, and I'd started making my campfire now. While making the fire, I would started thinking about the poster of the missing girl that I saw earlier. I could only imagine how her family's feeling right now, I said to myself. It was officially nighttime at this point, 
and I sat in front of the fire roasting marshmallows and hot dogs, like a typical camper. As I finished up eating my food, I decided it was time to go to sleep, so I put out the fire, entered my tent, and then crawled into my sleeping bag. I would say a few hours went by, when I suddenly woke up from hearing footsteps nearby. I wonder who that is, I thought to myself. I pretended like I was still asleep as the footsteps walked past the tent, but then I heard another sound. It was the sound of something brushing up against the tent. I opened my eyes and I turned my head to where I thought the sound was coming from. Well, I then saw the most terrifying thing that I'd ever seen. It was a silhouette of a man holding an object with a long handle. I quietly moved my head closer and I looked at the object's handle. I wanted to find out what he was holding. It was an axe. I began to quiver in fear as I'd seen the silhouette outside walking around my tent. What was going to happen to me? I thought to myself. After a few minutes of circling the tent, the silhouette finally walked away. I waited for what seemed like an eternity before I could gather all the courage to get out of that tent and run. I carefully zipped open the tent and I began to make a break for it. I ran for about five minutes straight. I then heard a growl from behind me. I turned around slowly and my eyes widened. Standing 20 feet away from me was a very deranged looking man. He was wearing all black, including a black leather jacket, biker boots, and shiny silver buckles. The most disturbing part was that he had cuts all over his face. He then gave me a stomach turning smile, showing off his set of nasty yellow teeth, and he began walking toward me with his axe. That's when I turned back around and took off, all the while I can hear the man chasing after me. I ran for about 10 minutes until I finally saw my car parked out in the distance. I ran straight to my car, unlocked my car door, got inside, and then turned on the car and drove off. As I was driving, I was looking in the rearview mirror, and I would seen the man once again. He was just standing in the middle of the road, smiling directly at me. I'm now back home with my girlfriend, and I've never told her about the encounter, but as I'm writing this, I can still hear those sounds of the growls and laughter right outside my window. I can't get it out of my head. I know that it's all just in my head, but I just can't forget it. That was the scariest thing that ever happened to me. This is gonna be a long one, so I apologize in advance, but the background details are necessary for this story. I'm a 20 year old female. I was recently in Africa on vacation with my family, and we had stayed two nights at a desert camp in the Sahara. The first night, my sister and I were talking and hanging out with these guys who worked there, who were probably all around the ages of 20 to 35. It seemed like they were just very friendly and harmless. I noticed at the campfire that night that one of the guys started paying more attention to me specifically, and I felt a little uncomfortable but I figured it was just a language barrier or something. So out in the desert, you can see the stars really well and even the Milky Way on clear nights, but you have to wait for the moon to go down, which is around 2 a.m. I guess it's a normal thing for the guys to come around to the tents, which are luxury tents by the way. They're furnished with beds, lights, a toilet and shower, as well as a lock on the doors. So not your typical camping, they knock on the door to see if you're awake and if you want to come out to look at the stars. My sister and I were sharing a tent, my parents in a separate one across the walkway. The first night around midnight, I had told my sister that I was way too tired to go out because I was falling asleep. So she left to look at the stars without me, and I didn't lock the door because I didn't want her to get locked out if I fell asleep. Well, fast forward about an hour and I'm on my side asleep, when I suddenly wake up to then see a head peeking in from the tent door. I thought it was my sister, so I then groggily asked her, Hey, what the fuck are you doing? Because it was just really weird the way she was standing there. I start to wake up more, and I realize it's this fucking guy from the campfire's head, and he's peeking in my room while I'm asleep. 
Now, it could have just been a simple misunderstanding, but I felt totally violated with my privacy. Especially because, you know, we're on their territory in the middle of the fucking desert. Like, I'm not kidding. We had to take a 30-minute truck ride into the dunes. I was in a fight or flight at that moment. He literally woke me up with a panic attack, and I started totally freaking out. So I went to the door and I told him I was tired. He kept trying to get me to come out to the dunes with a blanket. Classic male move. But I just kept saying that I didn't feel good and I was really tired, which was true. At this moment, I didn't know where my sister was. I don't know where my family is. And I'm totally disoriented as fuck. And all I know is this man standing in front of me, literally just watching me sleep. I also don't know how long he was there for. It could have been a literal second, or it could have been two minutes. But either way, I was high-key horrified by this. I told him no yet again, and that I'd look at the stars tomorrow. He told me he wouldn't be at the camp the next night, and that's why he wanted to go out tonight. But I wouldn't budge. Once he finally realized that I wasn't going to come outside, he asked me if he could have my number, and I told him no, I have a boyfriend. I don't, but it seemed the only way this man would respect my disinterest by knowing I was with another man. Well, after I said that, he asked me for my first name. I ended up giving it to him because I didn't really think it would do much harm. I then said goodnight, and I locked the door this time. I then went to the bathroom, and I had really bad diarrhea. This isn't really important to the story. I just wanted to show that he scared the literal shit out of me. And while I was on the toilet... I heard him come back and start calling my name from outside the tent, but I just stayed quiet and didn't say anything. I finished in the bathroom and went back to bed, still trying to calm down from what had just happened because my heart was racing, and I still heard him calling my name. I laid in bed as still as I could, and I didn't say anything. I tried texting my dad, but he wasn't answering, and I didn't really feel comfortable leaving the tent. Finally, my sister came back, and my dad was with her. So I told them what just happened, and they were really confused. They thought it was weird, but the conversation didn't really go much further than that. The next day, I had brought it up at breakfast yet again, and my sister and dad basically told me that I was just being dramatic about it, and that I should really just stop talking about it already, because it wasn't that big of a deal. Literally, my mom was the only one who agreed that it wasn't okay at all. So, it's now the second night, and my sister and I were both out under the stars talking to the guys and relaxing. Keep in mind, though, it's very dark, and you can't see any of the faces. So, I was having a normal conversation with this one guy. I couldn't see him that well, and all was going well. After a while, he asked if I remember him. And I'm like, well, no, I can't really see you. So he tells me to shine a light on him. And so I do. And wouldn't you know, it's the same motherfucker from my tent. I especially wasn't expecting him to be the dude right in front of me because he told me he wouldn't be there that night. Which leads me to believe that he had picked up a shift just to see me. But I can't be too sure about that. Who really knows why he was there? But surprisingly... He was fine that night, and he actually respected my boundaries this time. So I decided not to say anything to the other guys who ran the camp. I was honestly planning on doing so if he did anything remotely uncomfortable, but he didn't. So the next morning we left the area, and a few days later, I actually started getting message requests on Instagram. This motherfucker found me. I had accidentally tagged the whole desert. So you're telling me he found me based on my name and location, not even a specific location, an entire desert, and my name isn't even unique either. Anyway, he starts messaging me, and although I'm creeped out, I'm also thinking, well, he's harmless, I might as well see what he says. He says, and I quote, You know, I'm really so happy to find your account. I was really looking for you trying to find you for a long time which I found highly creepy to even say to someone. But again, it could have just been a cultural difference, but who knows. I didn't answer, and he messaged me again a few days later, asking me how I was. But yeah, I didn't answer. 
I'm really curious to know what everyone else thinks about this, and if I really was overreacting, or if you think my gut feeling was actually right. I mean, he seemed to be actually harmless in the end, but you never know. On YouTube and in many articles, the Kenny of each MCAVE case has been widely discussed and theorized many times. Kenny Veach was a father and a husband who loved hiking for many days out in the Mojave Desert in southern Nevada. He also had a YouTube channel called Snake Bit McGee, containing videos of his adventures out in the desert. One day, however, he had posted a comment online about this strange cave that he had found while hiking in this canyon called Picture Canyon, just north of Las Vegas. He talked about this cave that he had found having a capital letter M shape for the top of the opening of the cave and how the cave was dark and deep. Now, Kenny was not only a longtime desert explorer, he was also a longtime cave explorer as well, and he's gone into many caves before, and is very comfortable inside them. He explained in this comment how as he began to enter this particular M-shaped cave, he began to feel this bizarre sensation that he could only describe as a vibrating sensation, as well as a feeling of fear and dread and how it became so bad that it just really spooked him, and he then took off running from the cave's entrance. His comment that he posted got a lot of people intrigued, encouraging him to go back and film the cave to document it. So he brought a firearm and some flashlights so he can be fully equipped for exploring the cave. He first hiked up to this pass called Wild Horse Pass, where an abandoned vertical mine shaft is, before dropping down the other side into Picture Canyon while videoing his voyage. He could not relocate the cave on this trip. Many people on the internet began calling his story fake and calling him a liar. Basically, he was pressured to go back. The final time he went out, he never returned, and he's been missing ever since. Many people have gone out to that area, and there's a few caves out there that have an M shape to them. One was actually on Kenny's video, and the other one was discovered by exploring abandoned mines in unusual places and he actually went into the cave. Interestingly enough, he finds an old glass bottle and an Area 51 warning sign. Now, there's a theory floating around that the M cave was an entrance to some secret underground military facility, and that the vibrating and dreadful sensation that Kenny felt was from an access denial system, which uses either long-wave radiation, like infrared radiation in microwaves, or infrasound, sound that is too low to be audible but can also cause feelings of fear and dread and a vibrating sensation. As to what actually happened to Kenny, some suggest that he was actually assassinated after he went into the cave, or he went out there to take his own life, or to just run away and start out fresh somewhere else. The cave in question was located near some Air Force bases, with Area 51 being fairly close, but who really knows? This happened to me last year. Here's a little background. I live in Canada, and I'm really big into hunting and the outdoors. I'm a 24-year-old male. Here in Canada, the deer hunting season has just started, and I always love hunting earlier. But at this time, due to my work, I could only get out hunting during rifle season. So I called my buddy Kyle and I asked him if he wanted to head out for the weekend on some land he owns, just to make it easier. The land he owns is over two miles of forest, and a river about a half a mile in, and the only way in is by quad. So we packed my truck and trailer, and we left, and of course we picked up two cases of beer. We got to his land at about 5pm. We unloaded our gear into the small quad trailer, and set out. We had to cross the river to get to the spot that we had scouted in the spring. After about an hour of trying to find a good place to set up camp, we found a perfect spot. Kyle is more of the let go kind of guy, so he set up the tent and I made the fire, and we sat and made some burgers. At this point, it was already about 10 p.m. After a few beers, I got up because I couldn't find my phone, so I walked over to the quads. From where we parked the quads, it was about 50 yards. As I'm looking for my phone, I hear this loud scream. But it wasn't like a human scream. It made the hair on my neck stand up. 
and I then hear Kyle yelling. You scream like a fucking girl. I just ignored him, and me being me, I decided to walk towards where I heard the scream. I maybe walked about 10 feet from the quad, and I hear a gunshot. I ran back to Kyle, then asking, Dude, why the fuck are you shooting? He then tells me then he could have sworn he heard someone talking. Well, as he said that, we heard the scream again, but this time it really scared the fuck out of us. After that, we both decided to stay up. It was already well into 2 a.m., and I still couldn't find my phone. It was a little after 2.30 a.m., and Kyle fell asleep. Shortly after that, I fell asleep too, but I later woke up to that same fucking scream yet again. This time, I took a big flashlight that I'd brought with us, and my gun, and I walked over further into the bush. I got to a point on the edge of a small grassy area, and I then shined the light all around. Well, I started looking, and in this small open area, I then see this thing crouch down with long arms. It's very skinny, and it then stood up. I swear it was like eight feet tall. It looked straight at me. It had pale eyes, sharp teeth like razors, and it just stood there. I tried getting myself to move, but I couldn't. It then again let out that horrible scream. I then dropped my flashlight, and I turned and ran back to the camp. Kyle was still sleeping, and I hear what sounds like crashing then following me. I wake up Kyle, and I tell him we're leaving now. At first, he didn't want to wake up, but he jumped as soon as that thing screamed again. We left our tent and everything there. We jumped on the quads and got the fuck out of there. As we crossed the river, there was something laying on the opposite side of the river, and as I got closer, it was a deer, and it had bite marks all over it. But what was really fucked up is its head was completely gone. That gave me every reason to get the fuck out of there. We got back to my truck, and I didn't even load up the quads. We just finally had enough of whatever the fuck that thing was. I floored it out of there. On the way back to his place, both of us were quiet. Neither one of us really said a word about what had just happened. By the time we got to his house, the sun was slowly starting to come out. We went inside, and he fell asleep pretty fast. But I couldn't. All I could think about is what that thing was and how it screamed at us. The worst part about it is what would have happened to us if we had both fallen asleep. Would we have ended up just like that deer? I haven't been able to sleep since this happened. Neither of us had gone back to get our gear. It's been about four days since this happened. Me and Kyle plan on going back to get our gear tomorrow. I really hope to hell we don't ever see that thing again. So here's an update. About a week after that happened, I decided to go out and see what was left of our stuff. Kyle said he never ever wanted to go near that place again though. So I said, well shit, I guess it's just me. So I hopped in my truck and I drove to the property. It was about 1 p.m. when I got there and it was a really sunny day, but it was a bit on the colder side. The first thing I saw was my quad upside down, and Kyle's quad was basically on its side fenders, and it was also scratched up very badly. My tires were flat, and there were claw marks. So I stopped for what felt like an hour, but was probably only about 10 minutes, to think how am I going to do this? I'm alone. So I grabbed my gun, and I made my way out. Now on foot... It takes roughly about 45 to 50 minutes to get to the spot, but I did make it past the river, and I paused. All I saw was a blood trail, so me being me, I followed it slowly, and I started going off the trail, but then from my left, about 50 yards, I saw this fucking thing hiding beside a tree, just looking at me. Yeah, fuck this, I said to myself. I then ran out, and I crossed to the river. All I heard was that same fucking thing screaming again. I made it back to my truck, and I didn't even take what was left of the quads. I just wanted to get the fuck out of there. I was just on my way back, calling Kyle, then just telling him that there was nothing left of our stuff. 
We haven't spoken about that day in over a year. Now, I've had a lot of people not believe this, and I honestly wish I knew exactly what that was that we saw. I know that we had guns, but what we saw definitely changed the way I saw hunting. In the end, I don't ever want to see that thing again, or ever hear that horrible scream. To set the stage for this story, we must go back to the far-off year of 1988. The location is the Cascade Mountains of Oregon. I was 10 years old, and with me was my mom, dad, best friend, and our golden retriever, Amber. We were very much an outdoor family, and we had many camping trips before this and since. But to this day, when I think about it, I still remember the terror I felt that weekend so long ago. After a brief talk with my father recently, it kind of came back to the front of my mind. He was also able to fill in a few details that I had forgotten. This holiday was like many others. We packed up the station wagon with everything we needed for a hike into one of our favorite lakes to camp at. To make this trip even more exciting for me was the fact that it was my birthday weekend and I got to pick this lake. After we arrived at the trailhead and got our packs on, my dad got his sidearm out and strapped it on his belt. In Oregon, open carry was permitted in national forests, and my dad had always had a gun in his hip while in the woods, which always added a sense of security. We had a close call with a bear one time, in which it really came in handy. The lake was about a four-mile moderate hike through some thick forest, but the trail itself was well maintained and never very busy, so it was going to be a very pleasant hike in. We started off on our hike, and back in the 80s, it wasn't uncommon to have your dog off leash on the trails in the forest, so we had let Amber run and do her thing. She was a good dog, and she never ran off too far for long or jumped on people. She did love people, though, and speaking of people, we hadn't seen anyone else on the trail after about two miles in on the hike, which was nice, since it was just all of us talking, laughing, and just enjoying the nature. My best friend and I started a hike ahead of everyone else because we were so organized and excited about finding the first and best tent spot once we got to the lake. Amber was bounding ahead of us and having a great time too. We were about 20 yards ahead of my parents when Amber stopped dead in her tracks. I thought that she maybe saw a chipmunk or something, maybe a bird, but her hackles came up and she let out the lowest of growls. She never growls, so we stopped walking, and I thought maybe a bear or a deer or something was just off the trail, and she had saw or heard it. We immediately started walking backwards, and my parents caught up to us. My dad had asked us what was going on, and I told him that Amber is up the trail and is growling at something. He tells us girls to stay back with my mom, and he walks ahead to where Amber was at on the trail. My dad gets up to her and starts looking around. I hear Amber whimper a bit while looking off the trail. My dad comforts her, and he calls her back, and then walks back to us. He says it must have been an animal, and that he didn't see anything right off the trail or ahead of us. He says to let him take the lead, and we continue to hike. It didn't take long before it was forgotten, and Amber and the rest of us are all having a good time again. We arrived at the lake, and much to my delight, there was no one else there camping. The water was clean and blue, and the shade from the trees made the whole scene just perfect. My friend and I found the best spot to set up our tent, and my parents followed suit. After we had set up camp, my folks went off to fish just down the hill, and my friend and I took off with Amber to walk around to the other side of the lake to catch salamanders. We only made it about an eighth of a mile when Amber stopped and yet again started to growl. We stopped and looked around, and we had heard the sound of brush rustling. Then right in front of us, a man walked out of the trees. Amber stayed right by our sides and started to bare her teeth. He was much taller than my dad, so at least six foot four, was very skinny, but he had broad shoulders. He was clean cut 
and he was wearing black jeans and a white polo shirt with loafers. I mean, he did not look like he had hiked at all or was even dressed for the outdoors. He almost looked like he came out of church. We just stood there trying to process the situation when Amber began to bark. The guy just stood there, not moving, and he smiled, like the creepiest smile ever. It felt like someone who thought that was what a smile was supposed to look like. Amber kept barking, and this got my parents' attention, and they looked up to us and called out for us to come back. We complied, and we started to walk back towards them. My dad had met us halfway, and he told us to go back to the campsite, and that he was going to go talk to this guy. We got back to our camp, and my mom sat with us. I could hear my dad asking the guy if he needed help, or if he was a fellow camper who had just set up a camp away from the lake. My dad was being polite and calm, but I could see he was on guard and trying to fill out the situation. Now is the time to mention that my dad was ex-army, and he can be very intimidating when needed. The conversation continues. The guy told my dad he was just on a walk and that he didn't mean to intrude on us. The guy says goodbye and walks back into the woods. My dad walks back to camp and he sat down and he told us that he thinks the guy's just a yuppie camper and that he doesn't know too much about the outdoors. But my dad did say that he got a weird vibe off of him and that he would definitely be keeping an eye out for him. Amber stayed by our side and was just calm, yet she kept looking towards the direction the guy went. A bit more time goes by and we have a nice campfire going and the sun was just starting to set. We had cooked some dinner and we made some s'mores afterwards. My friend and I decided to go to our tent and read some books and tell each other some scary stories. Amber followed us to the tent and laid right outside of the door. My parents walked to the lake to sit and have a beer and just generally chill. They were never more than about 50 yards away. Not long after my parents walked away, I heard Amber start to growl. Then we hear footsteps coming from the woods behind our tent. My friend and I turn off our flashlight and go quiet to listen. The footsteps stopped right at the edge of the woods. We then hear heavy breathing and a grunting sound. Amber starts to bark, and we then hear the footsteps retreat to the woods. Amber whimpers a bit, and I then hear my parents walking back to the camp. I go out, and I tell them what happened. My dad said that he heard Amber barking, and that's why they came up. I asked my dad what the hell we should do, what's going on, and if that strange guy was the one creeping around. He tells me that we'll see about moving camp in the morning, since we still have three days left on the trip and that nothing's really happened to warrant just leaving. But he said that we'll play it by ear and just be a little more vigilant, and that if something changes, we'll decide what to do next. He tells us to try and get some sleep, and we all turn in for the night. The next morning, we all get up and have breakfast. After breakfast, we head down to the lake to fish. It was a beautiful day, and we were having so much fun, the events from the day prior were almost forgotten. We decided around lunchtime that we would go for a short hike to the waterfall that's just up from the lake. We were only gone for about an hour, and when we came back, we found our tents open and our sleeping bags drug out to the ground. My dad tells us to hang back with my mom while he goes to investigate. He comes back and he says nothing is missing, but it wasn't an animal that did this. He says we should break camp, hike back to the car, and find another spot to camp for the next couple of days. I could tell that my dad wasn't wanting to frighten us, but I could hear the urgency in his voice. I was very disappointed, but if it meant we could enjoy the rest of the trip and not worry about some creep messing with us, then it was worth it. We broke camp and started our hike back. Dad was in the lead, and we were double-timing it, and we made it back to the car in record time. As we walk over to the car, We see that one of our tires was flat. Not a big deal. We always had a spare, but when my dad bent down to start taking the lugs off, we swore. It was not just a flat. Someone slashed the tire. Dad changed the tire in record time, and we threw everything in the car, and he goes to turn on the car, but it wouldn't start. 
Dad starts swearing, gets out of the car, and pops the hood. Shit, he says. It turns out someone had took out our spark plug wires. Now, old cars like that Chevy wagon didn't have internal hood releases. You could just pop the hood from the outside. Dad slams the hood, says some very colorful words, and kicks some rocks. We were stuck, and no one else was at the trailhead. We were stranded. My parents are calm under pressure, and after a few minutes of discussion, it was then decided that Dad would start walking down the road until he could hitch a ride to town and go to the auto parts store. Mom and the rest of us were going away with the car and look for someone to hopefully pull into the trailhead and help us. A few hours go by, and no one else has come to the trailhead. It's starting to get hot at this point, and we're all getting very hungry and tired. My mom makes us some lunch, and we go sit under a tree to cool off. Amber's by our side and very calm, but then we hear a voice. Amber leaps up and starts to whimper. The creepy guy from yesterday comes down the trail and is asking my mom if we need help. My mom tells him we're fine, that it's all being settled, and that my dad, her husband, will be back soon. The creep then tells her that his camp is close, and he's parked on the old fire road that's near the lake, and he asks us if we would like to come back to his camp and wait until my dad returns. My mom sternly tells him no, and that we'll just wait here, but thank you anyway. He does not like this. He tells my mom that it's not safe out there for a pretty lady and two young girls. My mom, like my dad, is no pushover, and she asserts herself again that we don't need any of his help and to please just leave us alone. The guy just stands there, smiles wide, and then just turns around and leaves. As you can imagine, my mom is visibly shaken, and us girls were just a bit scared. My mom comes over to us and tells us that we need to stay close, don't wonder, and that we'll all be okay. My friend and I are really kind of freaked out at this point, and we're just hoping that my dad will make it back soon. After about 30 minutes, the creepy guy comes back. This time, though, he's not alone, and he has a slightly younger guy with him. The other guy is dressed as a yuppie camper and had a very stern look on his face. My mother stands her ground as they approach. Amber starts to low growl, and her hackles go up. The two guys flank us, and one of them flashes a gun tucked into his belt. The older guy tells us that we need to go with them, and that they were not asking. My mom backs up next to us, and without taking her eyes off of them, reaches to her belt and pulls out her bowie knife. My mom then said we will not be going anywhere, and that they need to leave now. The two men didn't even flinch at this, and they said we will come with them or they will hurt us. Right at this moment though, Amber goes from just growling to now barking, and she then puts herself between us and them. This makes the guy stop. My mom then yells that they need to leave now. They start backing up, and right at that moment, we then hear a truck pulling into the trailhead parking lot. At the side of the truck, the guys start to walk away very fast, then disappear right into the tree line. The truck was a forest ranger, and he had my dad with him. My dad jumped out of the truck and ran over to us, asking if we're okay. The ranger came over and asked who those men were, and also asking if we're okay. My mom explained everything that happened, while my dad hugged us girls, then telling us we'll all be okay. The ranger takes off looking for the men. My dad tells us that he was about five miles from the town when the ranger picked him up, and he then took him the rest of the way to get the part for the car. Then he drove him back to the car, which leads us to the present moment. After hearing what happened, my dad was pissed, and he really wanted to find the guys who tried to kidnap us and had been terrorizing us for the past 24 hours. The ranger came back, and he told us that he almost caught up to them, but they had sped away in a truck with a camper in tow. They had been parked behind a small ridge behind the lake on an old logging road. He didn't get a plate, but he did radio a description of the men and their truck and camper to the local sheriff's office. He also took our information and said he would pass it on to them. He waited around with us until Dad had fixed the car and we were finally able to leave. We decided not to continue camping, 
and instead drive a couple of hours to spend the last two days of the trip at the beach and stay in a hotel. A few days later, a deputy called my dad and told them that they never did find the men. He said that it was most likely a crime of opportunity after seeing a woman with two girls in tow. He was sure they had been watching us from off the trail and had messed with our camp to judge how my dad would react. When my dad seemed to be too big of a threat, they sabotaged our car hoping to put us in a position where we were vulnerable. He said they would follow up with us if they found out anything else, but according to my dad, nothing ever came of it. Years later, I tried to do some research on crimes in that area of Oregon during the 80s that might have involved something like we experienced, but all I could really find was just a few reports of campers being robbed and a few cars being broken into. There was one case of a lady and her dog going missing from an area near there, but it was never determined what happened to her, or even if it was something bad or if she just ran away. I can tell you that we did go back to that lake a few years later, and we had a very uneventful camping trip. It was nice to go back and really find some joy in a spot that was special to me. I really hope those guys never hurt anyone, and that maybe they were caught for other crimes. I will never know, though. I just hope to never run into a situation like that ever again. I can confidently say that having a dog along with us helped our situation. She was the hero and kept us alert. Amber went on to live until she was 12 years old, and she passed with her favorite people around her. Remember to stay safe, stay watchful, and it never hurts to have a sweet, brave dog with you. I'm staying at a private campground in Vermont. I'm a 34-year-old female who's barely 5 foot 3. This happened almost three weeks ago. It was on a Sunday night, right around the first week of August. I was sitting on the step to my camper with a fire going, smoking a bowl and drinking a beer. Another camper comes over. It's an older guy in his early to mid 40s and he had asked to chill for a bit. I didn't think much of it and he then left about an hour or so later. The rest of the night is pretty quiet and I pass out. The following day, which is a Monday, Everything is going normally until about 5 p.m. The door to my camper opens, and my dog starts going ape shit. I turn around, and I see the same guy from the night before. Let's call him Jay. I quickly say, What the fuck are you doing in here? Get the fuck out! And after some words back and forth, Jay finally leaves. I lock my door behind him, and I go about my day. 8.45 p.m. comes around, and I once again hear my dog growling. As soon as I look out the window, I see Jay. Within three seconds, he's gotten hold of the handle of my door, trying to open it for like ten minutes, while yelling, Let me the fuck inside! I don't respond, and he leaves. At this point, I'm freaking the fuck out. I was tempted to call the cops, but I figured I would go to management first. Tuesday comes around, and I sneak out to take my dog to the bathroom. I get back in with her, luckily without issue. About 10 a.m., Jay is once again back pounding on my door, telling me to let him in. I yell at him no, and to go away. His response was, Well, then come out here and hang out with me then. I once again tell him no, and to leave. This guy actually comes back five other times that day doing the same thing, as well as trying to look through my windows asking me to let him in. Well, 9pm rolls around and I'm curled up in bed with my dog. Within about three minutes, Jay was back trying to open the door to my camper, which thankfully was locked. While this is happening, I hear my boyfriend's bike coming up and Jay bolts. The next day, he tries coming over with my boyfriend here, and he then looks in the window and sees him. Wednesday was pretty quiet for the most part, until I went down to the bathrooms around noon. I hear a growl and bark, and as I'm headed to the bathroom, I get halfway there, and I hear someone behind me. I don't think too much of it because there's a lot of people here. That's when I then hear, Hey, where are you going? It was Jay. 
So I sped up my walk, and I got into the bathroom, then quickly locked the stall door. Jay comes in, and he then says, Well, you know, since we're both here, we might as well. And I then start yelling at him to get the fuck out of there and to get away from me. He finally leaves, and I get back to my camper. Wednesday night, Jay started to come over, but when he saw my boyfriend's bike, he left me alone. Thursday morning comes around, and I see Jay packing up and leaving. What a relief. Finally. He was gone all day on Thursday, but then Friday comes around, and around 11 a.m., I see Jay's camper in a busted up trunk pull into a site three away from mine. So I head down to the front office to let them know what's going on. Well, come to find out, multiple people complained about him doing the same thing. One of my neighbors actually saw what happened Monday and Tuesday and complained to the office on my behalf. Luckily, he hasn't been back. The people he was with are still actually here, and I'm honestly on edge since I don't know if he'll show back up. This is a true hiking slash camping story that happened to me about a year ago. A little backstory information. My mom was in the army long ago. She did her time a few years ago. She felt a void in her heart, like something wasn't there. Then she found her love for camping and hiking. My mom has been a camper for about six years now. She's planned every year for her hiking slash camping trips. She's been in the army, so being prepared is nothing. She's gone hiking and camping in the summer, spring, fall, and hell, even winter in the same mountains. All while my brother is her hiking and camping buddy. And it's honestly to the point that the little town knows my mom and brother, calling them the mom who hikes with her son. I live with my dad, and usually I visit her and my brother over the summer. Last year was my last time hiking and camping with her and my brother. And honestly, I'm not too fond of those mountains and what lies in those woods. The mountains I hike are called Pine Creek Gorge, or in this case, the Grand Canyon of PA. The West Rim Trail was a 30-mile hiking trail. When I say I'm not too fond of these mountains, I do mean it. My mom wanted to beat a new record with my brother and me to hike this 30-mile trail in under 47 hours. I didn't argue and agreed that we could do it. But in reality, I absolutely couldn't believe my mom. You see, you park your car at the trail starting point at the Brady Wallace picnic area, hiking this to Rattlesnake Rock. Then you have to hike another 10 miles down the mountain to get to a little town where we get sandwiches, soda, and our ride back to the Brady Wallace picnic area. Here's where it all begins. We had met halfway through our hike. It was getting dark, and we decided we needed to set up camp. Luckily, we were at a campsite made for this, and we were high up in the mountains and had a view. The woods surround it. My mom and I set up the tent, and my brother set up the inside. We change our so-called PJ, and created a massive fire. This helps keep the animals and insects away. We then make our food and eat. Then my mom hangs up the food back in a tree, which was to keep animals out of our food. It's very important to remember this food bag. Anyways, then we settle in to sleep. And that's when it happened. I remember waking up in the middle of the night, pitch black and blurry. I don't know why, I just did it, and that's when I heard it. I don't really know how to describe it fully. It sounded like a porcupine call, but deeper, and very unanimal, then turning into a bird-like sound. It was about five minutes, but it felt like hell. I heard shifting around the tent, as if it was walking towards the tent. Then it stops. I listened to the sound of water pouring, and that's when it hit me. It was freaking peeing next to our tent on my side. I kept hearing shuffles around our campsite. I could turn around to see my mom's figure upright in the tent. She asked in the lowest voice I heard, Do you hear that too? I replied back with yes. We waited a few minutes totally still, 
And then my mom finally got up, took out her machete, bear mace, and abandoned flashlight, and then went outside to investigate. If you're wondering where my brother is at this point, he's still asleep. And to all those wondering why he didn't go to investigate with us, well, my brother's 11 years old, tall and skinny, and he had a baby face like no other. So having a 40-year-old army woman stationed in Afghanistan with a license to kill and a mama bear on top of that is really the way to go. Anyway, I waited a few minutes with my mind rushing. What was that outside? Is my mom okay? Is this fight or flight? Where do I go? When I was thinking about what would happen, my mom accidentally hits the tent with the bear mace. My brother and I started to cough, feeling our lungs suffocating through this mace, and we then ran out of the tent into the night. We could only see the small fire pit still burning, and my mom standing outside looking frantic. She asked why we're out, and I told her about the mace. She said she was sorry. Then we stood in silence. I kept my side beside the fire, with my eyes glued to the deep, dark, dense forest only a few feet away from me. My mom said she saw nothing outside. About a good 20 minutes go by, making sure the mace evacuated our tent. We went back to the tent, and we laid down. My brother went back to sleep. My mom and I had a hard time falling asleep. I think the idea that something was out there in the woods, something waiting for us, it just really freaked us out. By the distance, I had heard a pack of coyotes howling, and I began to remember all those skinwalker stories that I had learned and heard all throughout my life. My eyes felt heavy, and I had finally fell asleep afterward. Once we woke up, I first walked to the place where I listened to the peeing, and it was very clear that day that it was still wet, and it smelled like a strong scent of urine. So we get dressed, use the bathroom in the woods, then eat and pack up. We're counting to hike the mountains, and about 11 miles from our last stop, we found a place. It was early noon and lunchtime. My mom had asked what we wanted. As she reaches for the food bag, she opens it up, and half of our food is gone. She looks wide-eyed and her mouth gaping. I looked at her, and then she looked at me. What she said still sends chills down my spine to this day. I wasn't very honest with you, kiddo. I didn't want to scare your brother, so I lied. I did see something, is what she told me. She explained why she sprayed the bear mace. When my mom got out of the tent... She heard the sound of feet near the tree where the food was hanging at. She flashed her light in the direction of the sound, seeing a tall shadow-like figure lit up like a man. So she of course does the thing, attack first, ask questions later with the bear mace, and it then fled towards the tent. My mom just kept spraying the mace until whatever the thing was ran into the woods. Not onto the trail, but into those dark, dense woods. Before we got out, she went back to the tree and saw the bag swing in the tree, thinking nothing of it. I think it was just a man messing with us, my mom always says, but I think it was something else. The strange sounds, the tall figure, how it made no sound of coughing when my mom sprayed it with the bear mace. We're in the middle of the mountains where no other soul is around, and if it really was a man... Why make those sounds? Why pee next to the tent? Steal our food. You need hot boiling water to eat that. We finished our hike, and I did what I usually do. I crossed it from the bridge that separated us from the town, turn around and flip towards the mountains, and shout out how much I hate them. Then turn around, walking to the small town. The woods aren't a place to mess around. With beauty... There's also fear, and luckily for us, we left those woods unharmed, and I just really don't think I ever want to go back. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night everyone, and remember, to always...